made perfect in weakness, a serialized historical Christian romance. Sonnets of the Spice Isle, Book 3. Written by Lynette Bonner. Narrated by Mary Sarah Agliotta. Part 1. 2 Corinthians 12.9. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Rovuma River, aboard the bee, headed inland. Dawn. Ryan stood at the bow of the bee and watched the dawn gray water slip away beneath the hull of the steamer. She wrapped her arms about herself and added a long breath of her own to the breeze drifting past. All the effort she'd put into cajoling Papa to return home had been for naught. Now she must set her mind to a different course, that of helping Papa reach the village on the shores of Lake Nyasa, where he felt called to go. Last night, she thought she'd come to peace with it, but this morning, she sighed. Papa ought not to be so stubborn. Ryan leaned over the side and glanced back the length of the boat to the disappearing ocean as the steamer and its passengers pressed forward into the mouth of the Ruvuma. Zanzibar was getting farther away by the minute. As they chuffed forward into the covering canopy of trees, shadow seemed to wrap itself around them like the claws of a fish hawk. Now she couldn't see much more than a lighter shade of grey, where the small steamship contrasted with the darker trees of the riverbanks streaming away behind them. She rubbed her upper arms as she leaned against the rail and tipped her face into the cool breeze. The wind cut like a machete through the thin material of the breeches Papa and Captain Dawson had insisted she wear for the inland journey. For now, she was missing the warmth of the many layers of her skirts, but she knew that within an hour of the sunrise, she would be thankful for the cooler clothing. From somewhere along the southern bank, she heard the distinct splash of a crocodile leaping into the river, probably startled by the steamer. The sound made her shiver. She'd never be able to see one of the creatures again without wanting to dispatch it forthwith, and her battle to save Nyanja's life was not at an end. The woman had been hot and delusional when they'd loaded her onto the boat this morning. After a dose of opium, Nyanja was now resting on the bunk in the pilot house, where June was also trying to get little Moyo, Nyanja's daughter, back to sleep. The only other warm space on the entire little boat was a common room, just behind the steersman's cabin, where Ryan presumed the rest of them would be sleeping on the floor come evening. Papa was already resting there on a pallet she'd made up for him. His breathing had been laboured and thready this morning, each inhalation rattling, each exhalation wheezing. She shivered and turned back to face the ribbon of the Ruvuma before her. How much longer did he have, her papa? And what was she going to do way out here on her own when he was gone? How would she get back home? She'd written letters, one each to her siblings, Jasmine and Rory, and even one to mother, telling them how papa was faring describing the journey thus far, and promising she'd be home just as soon as she could. Mr. Holloman, Captain Dawson's first mate and cousin, was returning to the island, and would deliver the letters on his arrival. A headache pinched at her forehead, and she rubbed circles at her temples, wondering if she shouldn't have been quite so forthright in her letters. But no, the family deserved to know that Papa probably wouldn't be returning to them then they'd at least have some time to prepare themselves for the impending news. She forced herself to thrust the worries aside. She would deal with all of them when the time came. The light of dawn had begun to invade the shadows. Along the banks of the river, large mangroves stood above the water like sentinels with long legs. The tall arching roots tangled together to form misty hiding places for animals and birds of all kinds. A long-legged grey heron, pulled his head out from under one wing to blink sleepily at them as they steamed by, and from the shadows of another root system, yellow eyes that belonged to an unseen cat of some sort reflected the light of the lantern hung on the long pole stretched out in front of the boat. 
From the village on Commodore Cornwall's estate, firelight flickered orange and yellow against the backdrop of the new grey sky. And somehow seeing the last of the estate solidified the immensity of what lay before her. Ahead, a canoe paddled by four native men sluiced through the water before the steamer. A lantern on a pole rising from the centre made them easy to spot as they led the way to the deepest sections of the river channel. The man at the rear of the canoe sang a long string of undulating notes, and then the other three responded with a sing-song chant. The song was obviously a rowing song, because their paddles kept time to the beat, and when they needed to increase their speed, the rhythm of the song also increased. The repetitive tune somehow soothed her, and when all along the eastern horizon behind the boat a thin line of pink began to outline the land, she made her way past the pilot house to the stone of the steamer to better see it. Soon shards of magenta, peach, saffron, and turquoise slashed across the canopy, creating one of the most fantastic sunrises Ryan had ever seen. Were someone to put the colours into a painting, people would claim the artist much too fanciful. She smiled softly, letting the sheer beauty wash over her and remind her that God was still in heaven, still in control. Movement beside her drew her attention to Captain Dawson, settling his forearms against the rail next to her, his gaze fixed on God's magnificent painting. Amazing, isn't it? She returned her own examination to the sky. Breathtaking. He hunched there for a long moment, his focus bouncing first from the array of colors in the sky to one embankment and then the other. He stood erect, folded his arms and craned to see around the cabin to the path of the river meandering ahead of them, then returned his gaze to the sunrise as he leaned his hands against the rail. His thumbs tapped out a rhythm, and he seemed to be waging a battle within himself. She put her back to the rising sun and tried to gauge what he'd been looking at. Ahead the river narrowed, and the embankments were dark and thick with foliage. What is it, Captain? He sighed. Unfortunately, he swept a gesture at the magenta sky behind them. It means we might be facing trouble downriver a bit. You'll need to keep out of sight in the common room for a couple days, till we know if the trouble has passed. She frowned. Whatever do you mean? How can such a striking sunrise possibly mean there is trouble ahead? Smoke. He rubbed one hand across his cheek and down the back of his neck, giving her an apologetic look, as though he knew he was stripping her of a moment of peace. Colors like that. He tipped his head toward the sky. Mean there is smoke in the air. And smoke likely means there's been a raid nearby. The river is narrow enough that anyone on the deck will not be safe from arrows should we come under attack. Her jaw tensed, and she flicked one last glance at the sunrise. Not even this one glorious moment remain untouched by evil. She clasped her hands and studied the toe of her boot, scuffing at a mark on the deck, as suddenly her emotions threatened to overwhelm her. She had been strong, strong for Papa, strong for her family, because they would have wanted someone to care for Papa in his last days. Strong for Nyanja, as she fought for her life, not once, but twice. Strong when Papa demanded she wear these confounded men's clothes for her own protection. Strong before the captain, because he expected nothing less. And now a simple little thing like the fact that the amazing sunrise was likely only the result of more death and destruction was nearly melting her into a puddle. She blinked hard and tipped up her chin, forcing the tears to remain at bay, as she said. All right, Captain. I will see to my father in the common room. But try as she might prevent it. Her voice broke on the last words. And as she spun away from him, he captured her elbow, stilling her. Miss Hunter. He gently tugged her around to face him, and the fingers of his hand skimmed a warm trail down her forearm. Just when his touch whispered warm and soft against her palm, and she thought he might entwine his fingers with her own, he yanked his hand away and propped it on his hip instead. Her heart stuttered, but she forced herself to fold her hand serenely and meet his searching scrutiny. His tongue darted out to moisten his lips. I'm sorry, I did not want to steal this moment from you, but for your protection. If she allowed herself to start crying, 
she might just never stop. She snapped her teeth together. Tears solved nothing. If there were any truths she'd learned over the years, certainly that was among them. And yet here she stood, his form not but a blur, and every fountain deep inside her threatening to burst forth. She lifted her chin, but couldn't quite bring herself to meet his gaze. Confound you, for being congenial. Just when I need you to be your normal, condescending self, Captain. He blinked, and if anything, his expression softened even more. He raised one hand to the back of his neck. If ever I have condescended, it has not been to you. You are a woman of strength and virtue. If I am harsh, as I've said before, it is only for your protection. A shiver of awareness prickled her skin, even as her stomach tightened. Oh, the crazy extremes to which this man could send her reeling. Right at this moment, she would like nothing more than to step forward and have him wrap her in a firm embrace, one that blocked out all the world and its deplorableness. Instead, she forced herself to step back. She needed to make an escape, and quickly. She started away, but once more he reached out to stop her. She jerked her elbow from his grasp. Let me go, Captain, before I embarrass you with unnecessary tears. You could never embarrass me, and tears are not a weakness. She sniffed. Mother would certainly contradict that statement. She folded her arms and refused to look at him. Neither are they a strength. A heart that breaks when evil wraps its choking fist around the world certainly shows a strength of character, to my way of thinking. She pressed her lips together, unsure how to respond to that, but after a moment she conceded his point with a nod. Thank you, Captain. Dipping down to better see her face, he leaned closer. I think, since we've known each other for quite some time, and since we are here in the wilds of the continent far from society, in all its moors, we could drop formality and simply call each other by our given names. Don't you, Ryan? The sound of her name spoken so quietly and tenderly from his lips jolted through her, and she pulled in a breath. Her eyes snapped to his. It would be so easy out here in the middle of nowhere, with no other confidant, to allow the man to woo her. She must stay strong and remember he did not know her true lineage, and that if he did, it would likely change his feelings drastically. Th that would be most improper, Captain. She stepped away, once more aiming for escape. I see. He leaned into his heels, folding his arms over his chest, but his gaze never left hers, and a smirk ticked up one corner of his mouth. I've never been much for propriety. So how about this? I will call you Ryan, and you can stick to formality and call me Captain. The connotation he gave the last word sent a spear of indignation straight to her marrow. Why, of all the... She reached to lift her skirts, only to be reminded she wore the blasted breeches. Giving a huff, she presented him with her back. But with her first step, the deck dipped out from under her foot and she nearly sprawled flat. She caught herself on the gunwale just in time. To the captain's credit, only the slightest hint of humor gleamed in his eyes when she glanced back at him. Straightening her sleeves with a jerk, she made a retreat that would have had much more effect could she have accomplished it properly the first time. Only once she reached the common room did she realize her peak with the man and his dratted ship had all but erased her near descent into tears. In the makeshift cabin he'd set up under a tent on the bow of the deck, Trent sank into his chair. They'd sailed upriver for five days and now were anchored in a shallow inlet so that dinner could be cooked on a fire along the river bank. None of the riverside villages they'd passed seemed to have experienced trouble. The scent and sight of smoke, however, had not dissipated all week. And now, while most of the inhabitants of the Bee were on land, he waited for the scout standing before him to give his report. He pierced his scout with a look, and the man clapped his hands together in the custom of his culture, giving a little bow. It is as my white friend feared. Many villages, ransacked and burnt. Trent hunched over in his seat and scrubbed his hands down his face. He looked along the length of the Rovuma. Could it be Khalifa? 
the man hadn't wasted any time. If so, and was being careful to keep his handiwork hidden from anyone sailing up the river behind him, of course Khalifa had known Trent and his party were coming along behind him. Trent clenched his jaw. He needed more information. There was nothing for it but to leave the boat for a few days where he headed overland to see what he could find out. He had many suspicions and suppositions, but not an ounce of proof. Trent turned to John, the man who had served as his bosun the last several years. Get our friend some food and his payment, would you? Oi, Captain. And John? The man stilled. Yes? Prepare rations for three days for seven men, would you? And tell Keiko I'd like for him to join me on the trip. I may need his knowledge of the tribal languages. John looked resigned. Oi, Captain. Sail during the day and anchor well before dark. I will find you upriver once I know more. John gave a tight nod. Trent pressed his palms to his thighs and used the movement to help himself stand. Like an old man suddenly hit by weariness after only toddling in his garden, exhaustion took hold seemingly of his very marrow. This battle was not something he wanted to face. But since when had any man looked forward to taking up a war? He needed to find Ryan and her father and give them an excuse for his inland trip. He found them on the riverbank. Ryan squatting on the balls of her feet, with her father seated on a flat rock before her. She held a bowl of stew and was trying to coax the doctor to partake, but he kept waving the spoon away. It's really quite good, Papa, she urged, and you need to keep your strength up. A touch of hopelessness edged her brow, but there was a cajoling tilt to her head. Trent had to admire her attitude. She had wanted nothing more than for her father to return to Zanzibar where he could die in peace with his family nearby. But now that it was too late to change her father's mind, she seemed to have taken up a new cause, one of keeping him alive and well long enough for him to see his call fulfilled. Trent's weary footsteps ground against the sand at the edge of the river, and she glanced up. Her cajoling expression turned stony the moment she laid eyes on him. Perhaps he had twitted her one too many times about, addressing him as captain over the past few days but the very thought roused the devil in him and touched the corner of his mouth with humor. Apparently taking note of his mischief, she glowered at him, but it was fleeting, and that was when he noticed how pale and weary she appeared. She was working herself too hard, trying to care for everyone. Nyanja's leg had grown infected, and she'd been lying at the very gates of death since they had brought her on board. He knew Ryan was spending many of the night hours caring for the woman, and thus wasn't getting the sleep she needed. He spun on his heel and went to the stew pot, filling two bowls and taking up two spoons. He was back by her side within moments, urging her to take one of the bowls. Any chance I could trouble you to eat a bowl of soup yourself, Miss Hunter? A look of surprise on her face. She accepted the bowl he offered. Her father's bowl still held in her other hand. He took it from her and pressed it into the doctor's hands nudging the spoon closer to the man. I'll sit here and eat with the good doctor, so you can partake of your own meal now as well. He sat down on the stone next to the doctor and set to eating as though he hadn't a care in the world, and was quite pleased to see from the corner of his eye that the man lifted a spoonful of broth to his own lips, albeit with trembling hand. Miss Hunter's jaw dropped slightly, and when she met his gaze, he offered her a wink. She almost rolled her eyes. He resisted an outright chuckle. No man, no matter how feeble, relished being coddled like a newborn babe. Her father would likely eat a sight more were she to leave the man to consume his victuals in peace. And now it was time to get to the business at hand. I've come to tell you both that I'll be... doing some scouting with a handful of our men over the next few days. I'll meet with you all further up the Ravuma. Ryan sank down to sit in the sand and took up her spoon even as she leveled him with a scathing look. Opt to find your first herd of elephants, are you? Something like that. He blew on a spoonful of the fish and rice. She made a disgusted noise in the back of her throat. Before I leave, I have something I want to give you. Your last will and testament, perhaps? There was bite to her words, but he only chuckled. She was curious. He could see that. 
but she managed to restrain any more of her questions and tucked into her meal. They ate in silence, if an evening filled with the tapanic rush of water over stones, lusty bird song, and the chatter from a copse full of monkeys could be considered silence. Trent emptied his bowl and noticed that Dr. Hunter's bowl was now half empty as well. But the man didn't seem to be eating any more, and exhaustion drooped his shoulders. Trent relieved him of his bowl and stacked the dishes together on a nearby rock. Then he took the man by the arm and helped him stand. How about I help you to your pallet, while Miss Hunter finishes her repast? He leveled a look on the younger of his charges. If you'll wait here for me, Miss Hunter, I'll return shortly. Without giving her time to argue, he led her father back to the steamer. Once he had the man comfortably situated on his bed, he made his way to his own pallet beneath the canvas at the front of the little ship. From the center of his bedroll, he withdrew the violin case and studied it for a moment. Commodore Cornwall had given it to him to give to Ryan just before they departed his estate last week. Trent had almost given it to her several times over the past few days, but the timing had never seemed right. Now that he was heading inland, however, he couldn't kid himself about the danger he might be walking into. And if he didn't return, he at least wanted her to have this one comfort to carry her through the difficult task of getting her father back home. Also, if he was honest, he wanted to hear her make it sing one last time. He really should have given it to her sooner, and now he regretted that. Each night he could have coaxed her for just one song, for her sake, as much as for his own. He tucked it beneath his arm and strode purposefully down the gangplank. Little Moyo was heading up as he was heading down. The child had been most reluctant, almost fearful, in his presence the first few days of the trip. But more recently she seemed to be tolerating him rather well, something he wanted to foster. Moyo, he called to her, would you like to hear something beautiful? The little imp's eyes widened, and she nodded her head vigorously, even though he had strong doubts over how much of what he just said she truly understood. Her mother's dialect was quite different from the Kiswahili he spoke. Come on, then, he motioned for her to follow him. The bowls he'd stacked on the rock were missing, and Miss Hunter was not where he'd left her. Instead, he found her father down the river with June, washing up the dishes from the evening meal. They were standing within the temporary fence the men had erected to keep the crocs at bay. The sight of Ryan bending over one of the large cast-iron pots gave him pause, and he came to a stop. Had the doctor's daughter, who'd grown up with servants to do her every bidding, ever washed a dish one day in her life? He knew that each evening up to this one, she'd gone straight back to the steamer to sit by Nianja's side, while June had gone to do the washing up. But happily, Nianja seemed to have turned a corner during the night, and had rested fever-free all day today, so Ryan probably felt like she could be put to better use helping June. Moyo stopped by his side. Ryan watched June scrub one of the pots for a moment. Then her nose wrinkled, and she gave the pot sitting at her own feet a disgusted bump with the toe of her boot. It didn't budge. Casting one more glance at June, as if to verify she really was seeing what she thought she'd seen, Miss Hunter finally bent and scooped up a handful of the river sand, thrust her hand inside the pot, and set to scouring the iron with the handful of grit, just as June was doing. After a moment, Still carefully mimicking June's every move, Miss Hunter made to lift the cast iron pot and swirl some water into it. But the moment she tried to lift the cast iron, she let out a squeak and stumbled forward, losing her grip on the pot. It was obviously much heavier than she'd expected it to be. Trent pressed his lips together to suppress a grin, but beside him, Moyo, held no such compunctions. She covered her mouth with both little hands, hunched her head into her shoulders, and giggled loudly. The sound brought Miss Hunter's head around with a snap. But as soon as she saw it was Moyo there laughing at her, her peak morphed into humor. She bent down and shook her finger at the little girl. If you want to laugh, little Miss Moyo, I invite you to come and see if you can lift this pot. Moyo stretched her hands out wide and chattered something that neither one of them could understand. Trent gestured to the pot with one hand, while lifting the violin case with the other. How about you trade me, Miss Hunter? I'll finish the pot, 
but as payment, I expect you to play me a song. As soon as her gaze lit upon the violin case, Ryan's eyes widened. She quickly rinsed her hands in the river and then patted them dry on her breeches and hurried toward him. How? A sheen of appreciation glistened on her lower lids, and she couldn't seem to find any other words. Something cinched up tighter than a bowline knot in his chest. He cleared his throat and laid the case into her outstretched palms. It is from the Commodore. Softly, she swept one hand over the smooth surface of the case. But it was his wife's. He said she would have wanted it to go to someone well-versed in the instrument, and that he's heard none as well-versed as you. Oh, Captain, this is a most welcome blessing. He took in the flush of excitement pinking her cheeks, and the spark of anticipation in her emerald eyes. Indeed. He stepped back and folded his arms. Moyo chattered something again, and stretched out her arms before her. Miss Hunter laid the case into Moyo's outstretched arms and clicked open the latches. She folded back the instrument's covering of burgundy silk and cradled the violin to her chest, like a mother welcoming a long-lost child. Finally, just when he'd begun to think he might have to prod her to it, she reached for the bow and tuned the instrument briefly. And then, standing on the shores of the Ruvuma, with the sounds of the camp, and God's nature rising up around her. She closed her eyes and pulled the bow across the strings in one long and plaintive note that led to another and then another. The melody flowed as though from her very heart, and he was so enraptured with watching her play that it was many moments before he remembered he ought to finish cleaning her pot. But when he turned to the task, it was to find that June had already completed it, and the pots were stacked neatly by her feet waiting for someone to return them aboard ship. Trent used that as an excuse to escape his building emotions. Lifting the pots, he strode up the gangplank and returned them to the corner of the deck where they were stored. Then he dropped onto his pallet, clasped his hands behind his head, and let Miss Hunter's songs serenade his soul. She only played three, but even after she returned to the ship, all the camp lay in quiet as though a holy hush had been brought on by her music. Part Two Trent and his scouts left camp just as Periwinkle began to seep into the blackness of the night sky. Birds were already welcoming the dawn with hearty abandon, and the cicadas and crickets were singing their last duets before the heat of day drove them into silent hiding. Tremp paused at the top of the first hill and looked back toward the camp. He'd left a good contingent of men with the steamer, who should serve as more than adequate protection should the group come under any attack. But as adept as Miss Hunter was at finding trouble, with a grunt of disgust, he forced himself to walk away and not contemplate all the predicaments she could get herself into while he was gone. The first village they came to remained intact, although at the outset, except for the hot coals still burning in several fire pits, they would have thought the village deserted. So hidden did the inhabitants make themselves at the sight of the strangers drawing nigh. Only when Trent and his men laid out trinkets for trade did one brave saw emerge from the brush behind a hut. After he successfully traded a small knife for a bag of sugarcane stalks, others slowly seeped from their hiding places, the last being the village headman who invited them to stay for a feast that evening. Word had travelled quickly from village to village of the men attacking settlements along the Rovuma, and the headman directed them toward the northwest, a track that would take them farther from the river. The next village they came to was not so lucky as the first. Trent's stomach clenched when they crested the rise above the huts and saw the smoke wisping in misty tendrils from several piles of rubble that had once been homes. The mud walls of several huts still stood, but the thatch roofs had collapsed and smoldered within the circular walls. Next to the path that led into the village, an old woman lay sprawled, an arrow through her throat, eyes gaping in horror. Just outside the door to a still smoldering hut, a small child of just over two years lay dead. 
too small to pack a load for the slavers, too big for his mother to carry both him and a tusk of ivory. A life cut down in the tight bud of innocence. Flies already covered the little body. Defeat washed over Trent. He settled to his haunches next to the child and surveyed the carnage in the rest of the village. Gardens trampled, goats still penned, bleeding in hunger. The old and young, dead where they fell, and everyone in between, taken. His hand shook as he shooed away the flies and lifted the little body into his arms. Release the goats so they can forage, he commanded, and bring them. He nodded toward the other dead. We will bury them, and then move on. For days they traveled, and for days they found no survivors. The path of butchery finally led back to the villages on the banks of the river. The man wasn't even bothering to disguise his actions now that he was farther inland, farther from any authority that might be sent for. There was no proof. No one left alive to speak against the one who had committed the atrocious acts, but Trent knew. And what angered him most was the fact that the man's actions weren't even illegal. The only way to put him away was to either kill him, and if he was working for someone higher up, killing him would only result in a new trader being sent to replace him, or follow him to the coast and pray he made contact with his leader, and that they tried to transport his slave somewhere other than Zanzibar, which was illegal due to the Hamilton Treaty. Late one night, Trent lay in his bedroll, hands clasped behind his head, studying the myriad stars in the thick blackness overhead. The savannah grasses sang sibilantly, as if all was right with the world, and somewhere far off, a lion roared, deep and low. Llewellyn Cornwall, the British officer who had hired him for this mission, had warned him, it would not be easy. He had cautioned Trent against moving too quickly, lest the man at the top escape and hire new underlings to continue pillaging on his behalf. Trent knew Lou was right. The only way to put a stop to this was to figure out who the lead man was. But God help him. He couldn't just stand by and let the carnage continue. Khalifa had to have others working for him. With a number of villages he'd sacked, he couldn't be keeping all those people with him. He must be sending them off in groups to the coast, with men from his party, or men he had bribed to help him along the way. Often natives could be bought off, with as little as some bolts of cloth and the promise of their freedom. For such a small price they would turn on their fellow man, and lead caravans of them to Bagamoyo, where they handed them off to someone appointed to close the deal. His gut clenched as he considered the number of lives that could be affected if he didn't do something. God, what am I to do? He whispered into the expanse. Every instinct within him rang with urgency for action, yet he had the doctor and his daughter to think about also, and he could only do one thing at a time. He needed to get the hunters to the lake and get them settled. Then he would worry about what to do with Khalifa. Already, he and his scouting party were days late returning to the bee. Tomorrow they would head back. He closed his eyes and focused on the vision of Ryan Hunter. A smile tugged at the corner of his mouth. After so many days of witnessing nothing but death and destruction, it would be good to see someone pure and lovely once more. And that was when he knew. His eyes flew open. He'd been fooling himself into thinking otherwise. But now it was quite clear. The little lioness had firmly sunk her teeth into his heart. Two weeks later, Ryan stepped off the boat and stretched the stiffness from her back. The days melded one into the next. It had been too long since the captain had taken leave of them with several men. Before he'd left that dawn, he'd said that they only needed to go inland for a few days to do some scouting and that she wasn't to leave the party near the river. The days since had stretched interminably. Where was the captain? Had he been injured? Killed? The party of men who'd been left with the steamer were growing restless. She'd heard them grumbling to John Knight the evening before. She didn't know what the boss had said to them. 
but whatever it was seemed to have appeased them for now. She only hoped they stayed so, at least until the captain returned. She was thankful that, though he had to rest often during the day, Papa seemed to be holding his own. The evening repast was generally cooked by one of the village men over an open fire along the bank, and either Ryan or June would take a portion to Nyanja, who still recuperated in the captain's cabin. The weather had remained mostly dry, but only two days after the captain's departure, a torrential rainstorm had come upon them late one night, and the stores of rice had been ruined. So for nine solid days they had eaten unseasoned, either roasted hare or fish, accompanied by a tasteless thick porridge, the consistency of day-old oatmeal. For each day's breaking of the fast, the porridge from the evening before was fried and eaten plain, as they set sail for the day's journey. Sometimes there were crocodile eggs, if one of the men had found a nest in the sandy banks of the river, but after her experience with the vile beasts, Ryan wanted nothing to do with them, even if it meant eating their unhatched young. Besides, the egg's taste, even though it was near cousin to a regular chicken egg, contained a smack of something off that set her teeth on edge. At noon it was always so hot no one wanted much, save a few sips of cool water or a piece of fruit from one of the wild trees along the river. Tonight they had anchored in a tranquil bend of the Rovuma near the sandy shore. Ryan's stomach grumbled even now. She hadn't eaten since the tasteless porridge slice that morning. But on this evening, one of the native men had recognized a wild plant and dug up its roots, which turned out to be thick, potato-like tubers. He had assured her were most agreeable to stomachs. Then she had come upon a small patch of wild vetches on the short walk she'd taken with June and Moyo, and they were picking what she hoped would be enough for a nice size soup when combined with the tubers. Moyo had grown accustomed to her now, and chattered incessantly in her native tongue, skipping and hopping and spending more time at the wild honeysuckle vine next to the patch of etches, sucking on blossoms than picking the wild peas with them. But Ryan couldn't find it in herself to scold the little one, and neither could June, it seemed. She was at this precise moment picking a honeysuckle bloom from the vine that Moyo couldn't quite reach. Ryan smiled and tossed another handful of vetches into her basket. When they returned to the camp, the men were just setting about to roast several fish. Ryan spoke to the men using the few words she'd learned of their language and the few words they knew of Swahili and managed to convey that she would like to do the cooking on this evening. The men quite gladly handed over the task, once they understood her meaning. June, fetch me the two burrs and a bit of salt from the ship's stores, would you? And I believe I saw a braid of dried onions. Bring one of those also. The flour and cornmeal that was normally put to use for the porridge, she mixed with a bit of the salt, some oily drippings from the fish, and water. While the fish continued to roast over the fire, and the vetches, salt, tubers, and onions boiled in the pot, she formed the dough into flat rounds and set them on the hot rocks at the fire's edge, turning them every few minutes so they cooked evenly. When the fish were done, she flaked them into the stew. It was neither the most satisfying nor the best-tasting food she had ever eaten, but it was a far cry above the fare they'd been consuming for the past few weeks. To a man, they thanked her, and Papa even went back for a second portion which made it all worthwhile. Hefting the now empty pot, she'd become quite used to the weight of it by this time. Ryan rested it against her hip and started for the river. As they did each night, the men had built a fence, a makeshift safety zone of sharpened sticks pounded into the riverbed, forming an arc from one place on the sandy bank to another. It gave the camp a safe place to fetch water and wash clothes and dishes along the river without fear of another crocodile attack. She set the blackened kettle in the sandy spot along the bank and caught sight of her arm as she took up a handful of sand and set to scrubbing. Her skin was becoming quite dark. She ought to be more careful. What would the captain say when he returned? Her face heated and she shoved the thought aside. She had no business worrying about what the captain might think of her. Mother, however. Mother would have a conniption could she see how brown Ryan had allowed herself to become? 
people would wonder, after all, how the daughter of a woman so blonde and fair could darken so easily. She finished scouring the pot at the river's edge and stood, pressing one hand into her aching back. Out here so far from everything, such worries seemed so paltry. Yet she'd lived with such remonstrations her entire life. Moyo ran, giggling down the path and paused only long enough to throw her little arms around Ryan's legs for a moment before dashing to the mango tree a few feet away and pointing chubby arms at a nearly ripe fruit hanging high overhead. Ryan glanced up at the fruit. You want that, do you? Her own mouth watered at the thought of the sweet, juicy pulp. She glanced back down the path. Where's June? The child flapped her little hand downriver to where the steamer lay anchored, and chattered a few indecipherable words. June must have taken Nyanja, her evening meal. Ryan glanced back at the little girl, whose large pleading gaze bounced from the fruit to her and back again. With a capitulating laugh, Ryan set down the pot. All right, let's see if we can't get ourselves a mango or two. She pointed to a rock. You sit there, Kalani. She remembered the word for sit in the child's Chiwa language. The little one clambered up onto the large rock, plopped down, and rubbed her chubby hands together. Ryan chuckled and assessed the tree. Grabbing the lowest branch, she hoisted herself upward. The branches were close together, and it wasn't long before she found a fairly ripe fruit dangling just out of her reach. Wrapping one hand around a branch, she leaned far out and scrabbled at the fruit taunting the tips of her fingers. She huffed and stood on her tiptoes to lean a little further. Moyo, if only my mother could see me now, the words were a grunt as she stretched full out. I'm sure she would be most impressed. Captain, Ryan sucked in a breath of surprise, but the fruit was firmly in her grasp now, and she plucked it, thankful his startling presence hadn't knocked her right out of the tree. Peering down through the leaves, she held it out for him to see, before she dropped it into his waiting hand. Impressed is not the word mother would use, Captain. She cleared her throat when the words emerged breathy and barely audible. He winked up at her with a grin. Likely not, I suppose. She clenched one fist, willing down the racing of her heart. He was back. This time she was careful to keep any emotion from her tone. I see you've returned no worse for the wear. And I see you managed not to get yourself killed while I was away. He squatted down by Muyu and handed her the fruit. Jabbering something in her high-pitched voice, the child thrust it back at him. The captain used the knife on his belt to slice through the thick, tough skin and peeled the fruit for her. Then rinsing his hands in the river and wiping them on his breeches, he glanced back up at Ryan. Since you are already up there, I'll take one too, if you please. A green fruit lay ready to hand. She plucked it and tossed it down to him. He eyed the hard green oval and chuckled, tossing it aside. Before she knew it was happening, he leapt up, caught a branch, and clambered toward her. Her eyebrows lifted and she clutched at the trunk behind her, sinking down to straddle the branch before she lost her balance altogether. The setting rays of the golden sun pierced her sanctuary, turning the leaves around her, which had only a moment ago been shades of green, to lemon and chartreuse. The captain swung onto her branch and straddled it, facing her. Planting his palms into the section of branch between them, he leaned forward. Humor etching his expression, he scanned her face, his gaze lingering much longer than propriety allowed. Slowly his humor slipped away, and something more intimate took its place in his expression. Why was he looking at her in such a manner when only a few weeks ago he'd made it very clear there could be nothing between them? yet she couldn't deny the pleasure pulsing through her veins. She felt her cheeks heat. He arched a brow, the glimmer in his grey-green eyes clearly revealing that her rising colour hadn't escaped his notice. Breathe. Just breathe. After a long moment, he leaned toward her. She ought to pull back and use the flat of her palm to remind him she was a lady. But with the trunk at her spine, she had barely any quarter to give. She wasn't sure she wanted to slap him. Her heart forgot to beat, 
and twisted into a knot of anticipation just below her ribs. He was still leaning closer, his gaze holding hers captive. Then, at the last moment, he turned his face aside and reached one hand past her shoulder. He was so close that she could feel the warmth radiating from his cheek against her own. A small snap, and he sat back and held up a red and yellow-green fruit for her inspection. One corner of his mouth pulled up in that maddening way of his. Yet somehow this time, it wasn't so maddening as it was endearing. Had he wanted to steal a kiss, but changed his mind at the last moment and used the fruit as an excuse? Or had he been reaching for the fruit the whole time and only taunting her? Pulling his knife from the sheath at his waist, he cut a thick slice of the fruit and held it against the blade with his thumb as he stretched it out to her. She took the proffered fruit and hoped he hadn't noticed the trembling of her fingers. This was an entirely new sensation sweeping over her. Frustration, peak, irritation. These were all emotions she expected to feel when the captain was present. But this? She wasn't even sure what this new feeling was. Something akin to the time lightning had struck the tree across the indigo field when she'd been hurrying home through the rainstorm. The strike had knocked her from her feet and set every inch of her skin to tingling. Yes, this sensation felt very similar. She hadn't realized how much she'd missed him. He was much too easy on the eyes. She sighed and bit the inside of her cheek, the pain grounding her firmly to the branch, lest she be tempted to float away on some airy dangerous emotion. Someone needed to say something to break the spell that seemed to have fallen around them. She scooped some of the tartly sweet pulp from the skin with her front teeth as she glanced down to make sure Moyo was still on her rock. While the rays of the sun still reached them here in the treetop, shadows were beginning to cloak the ground. But she could still see Moyo where they'd left her. Good. Keeping her gaze averted, she said, What can I do for you, Captain? Her words were carefully controlled. From her peripheral vision, she saw him grin. He cut another thick strip of the fruit, and his voice was low when he spoke. Oh, there are a great many things I can think of, Ryan. He deliberately emphasized her name, causing her gaze to fly to his once more. Slowly he brought the fruit on his blade to his mouth, his twinkling eyes never leaving hers. He chewed leisurely one eyebrow quirking up as if to challenge her to offer him anything he desired. Involuntarily, her focus dropped to where a bead of juice lingered on his lower lip. Her mouth went dry, and she forced her attention to the slice of fruit in her own hands, then took another bite. But like a ship at the whim of the wind, her gaze returned to him of its own volition. A breeze picked up and plastered his loose-fitting shirt back against the firm ridges of his torso. The lightning strike sensation returned in full force. She jerked her attention down to Moyo once more. She must remember that there would be life after this brief jaunt into the heart of the continent. Anything she revealed to the captain out here, no matter how tempting it may seem to do so, would soon find its way into the parlors of Zanzibar's upper crust. Mother would not take kindly to her revealing Papa's dark secret, and the captain deserved to know that much about her. Before, she swallowed again. Before what? A small thud in the brush below drew her attention. He tossed the mango down, and by the time she looked at him to see why, he already had his knife back in its sheath and had scooted so close to her that their knees were touching. Heart thudding with a mix of both rapture and terror, she searched his face, breath abated. Golden light filtering through the leaves mottled half his face leaving the other in deep shadow, which did much to hide his expression. But one emotion was clearly portrayed in his expression. Desire. And good Lord have mercy. That same yearning thrummed in her own veins, and each moment she gazed into his eyes urged it to greater strength. Her mouth went dry at the realization. How was it she had fallen for this man, who had tormented her in so many ways over the years? Slowly, hesitantly, his hand lifted, and he skimmed his fingers across her cheek, tucking a stray curl back. 
Ryan. Was his hand trembling? Her heart beat as though seeking release from the bondage of her chest. He settled his palm against her cheek. I've seen so much death and destruction over the last few days. Seeing you again is like a breath of fresh air. Barely able to see his expression in the deep shadows, she tilted her head for a better examination of his expression. Captain? Chipping up her chin, he dropped a finger against her lips and then leaned closer and rested his forehead against hers. Trent? Say it, please. Her heart hammered. T Trent? Slowly he eased back just enough to look her in the eye. That wasn't so hard now, was it? His words were barely audible, above the rushing tumble of the river below them, and the warmth in his grey-green eyes as he studied her nearly snatched from her the balance needed to remain on the branch. She swallowed and shook her head, her gaze lowered to his lips, and she whispered his name again. Trent. Ryan. His words were equally soft. He brushed the pad of his thumb across her lower lip. Would that I could. But as I've already stated, I can't let this go further. The words were firm, but there was a sadness, a regret that lingered in his eyes as he withdrew his hand from her. She trembled, feeling that he wanted more than the brief contact they'd just shared, knowing that she did. Yet also at the back of her mind there lingered an agreement with his assessment, the reminder that she had so many secrets he deserved to be told before he committed himself to her more deeply. So much she wasn't free to tell him. She studied the branch between them, picking at the bark with the nail of one thumb, took a breath to steady the crazy royal of emotions swirling through her. The clang of something metallic suddenly drew his glance toward the encampment that was clearly visible through a gap in the branches. John Knight stood by the camp's fire, but he was looking in their direction. Ryan doubted the boss and could actually see them from this distance, but it was as though a wall had suddenly appeared between her and the captain. Trent sat back, tucking his fingers into his armpits and clamping them there with crossed arms. He looked down at the branch and clenched his jaw before looking back into her face. His throat worked, and he scooted several inches back before resuming his stoic, arms-crossed position. He pressed his lips together and studied a leafy branch just to his right. Confusion plucked at her brow as, once again, disappointment marched through her. Confound the man for... For what? She wasn't sure. Well, just confound the man. Below them, Moyo finished her treat and stood to her pudgy little feet on the rock where she'd been sitting. Ryan saw her means of escape. Moyo, stay where you are, precious, she arched a brow at the captain. If you'll excuse me, captain. Slipping one leg over the branch so that both dangled from one side, she grasped another nearby branch and swung herself down to the ground below. There were at least some benefits to wearing men's attire. She was helping Moyo down from her rock when she felt the captain come to a stop beside her. June stepped into sight up the path toward the encampment. The firelight from the campfire danced brightly behind her in the rapidly descending dusk. Moyo dashed toward June, chattering and gesturing back toward the mango tree. Ryan started after the child, but Trent called her name softly. Ryan. She frowned but couldn't suppress the double-time rhythm of her heart. Why did her name on his lips have to sound so appealing? Captain, I need to explain. Please, stay a moment. He tipped his head, and she wished the rapidly falling shadows weren't so thoroughly concealing his features. In exasperation, she tossed up her hands, a gesture that urged him to speak. His feet shuffled as he took another couple steps away from her. He lifted one hand to grip the back of his neck, pegging her with a look. He kept his voice so low she could barely hear him above the rush of the Ravuma. Ryan, I have a confession. I'm not here on the continent to seek my fortune in ivory. Everything inside her tightened up like a drumskin. Whatever could he mean? There are other reasons, ones I'm not at liberty to reveal. Suffice it to say, were you and I to... He broke off and cleared his throat. The short of it is, I should refrain from 
associating with you. Those words shot as deep as a harpoon. She studied his expression. Could he know Papa's secret? Maybe from Papa he'd found out who she really was. If Trent knew she was the product of infidelity, that the woman who had birthed her had been a quadroon slave, and that Papa and Mother had been lying to everyone about her for years, of course he probably wanted nothing to do with her. No, that was not a possibility. Only the family knew. Papa had spent his life protecting her from that secret, and Mother's pride wouldn't give it up for torture. The only other person who had known was the woman who had died giving birth to her. So what could the captain's reasons for not associating with her be? Unless, she frowned, and a sigh slipped from her. Both times that they'd spoken of this topic, he'd offered her the same excuse, that there were reasons he was not at liberty to reveal. I should refrain from associating with you. Did he have another woman waiting for him back in the Americas that she didn't know about? A shard of pain lashed at her heart swift and sure as the strike of a mumba. That seemed a very logical conclusion, didn't it? And he'd been doing his level best to get her to use his given name. Well, her chin lifted. She had come to depend on him entirely too much. She would not allow herself to be hurt by this man. Trent, Captain, I must concur, because there is much you should know about me, ere we ever... Her face heated as she rolled her hand through the air. Much I am not at liberty to reveal. Now why had she gone and made herself so vulnerable by disclosing all that to him? She ended with a quick, even if I were inclined, to make it known to someone such as yourself. She gritted her teeth and forced herself to stop talking, lest she turn into a blubbering ninny, or worse, a haranguing biddy. He took another step back with a brief nod, jaw tight. I see. Folding his arms, he turned to look out over the moonlight undulating on the passing water. I understand. She was quite certain he didn't see or understand any of it, but she let it rest. Silence hung between them for a long time, and Ryan tipped her head and just watched him, his silhouette stark black against the water. His shoulders drooped, and he ran a hand over the back of his head. His words were ragged when he spoke. I'm glad you didn't see any of the destruction, Ryan. So much carnage and death. So much apathy for the welfare of other human beings. He sighed audibly and continued to stare out over the rippling river as though he might still be processing all he'd taken in. Finally, he gave himself a little shake and spoke. All business. I wanted to ask about your father and Yonja. How are they? I want to press quickly for the lake over the next two weeks. At the mention of her father, she swallowed hard against the desire to throw herself at the captain and begged for the comfort of his arms. Instead, she kept her hands tucked behind herself and her feet fast against the ground. The long days with nothing to do but sleep have been good for Nianja. She still has been fighting fevers, but the infection in her leg seems to be getting a little better each day. Every other day for the past week, We've been helping her off the boat, and yesterday she even made it a good distance with the crutches Mr. Knight made for her, before June had to help her back to the bee. She paused. Papa. She swallowed at the constriction suddenly gripping her throat. Papa seems to be... about the same. That was what she'd been telling herself. But the sharp look Trent turned on her with an upraised brow drew the full truth from her lips. He seems to be holding his own, so long as he gets plenty of rest. But his cough may have worsened a little. Her eyes stung, and she kicked at an exposed stone beneath her feet. I'm sorry. She nodded her thanks. The truth was, she knew she could lose Papa any day now. All the more reason for us to press harder for the lake. I would hate for us to have come this far, and for him to miss his dream. My men need rest tonight. We'll leave first thing in the morning. Part Three Trent was as good as his word. That evening he divided the men into two groups. One would navigate and sail by day, the other by night. Boss and John Knight was appointed captain of the day shift, 
and Trent would helm the ship by night. Sitting around the campfire that night, the men, especially those who would have to navigate the river by canoe at night, grumbled and complained until Trent had to offer them an extra shilling a week to keep the peace. Then those who had been assigned to the day shift set to grumbling about the fact that they were getting paid less than the others. Finally, Trent brought all the men around and had them draw stones from inside a leather bag. A black stone meant they were on the night shift and got extra pay. A white stone meant they got the day shift. Each week, they would repeat the process. This seemed to appease the men somewhat. The next morning, Ryan rose early. She wanted one last moment ashore before she was consigned to the ship day and night over the next few weeks. Slowly, she made her way through the thick grayness of dawn to the mango tree by the river. Leaning back against it, she watched the lightning horizon of the mountains ahead. One moment darkness covered the river valley, and in the next instant shards of light sprang over the mountain tops and cascaded into the valley below. The black water turned gray, and then a dusky brown. Something was different today. She frowned and tilted her head, trying to pinpoint what it was. Then her eyebrows rose, and she held her breath, listening. No birdsong accompanied the dawn. The skin at the back of her neck tingled with tension. Something wasn't right. And that was when a black mound floating in the river caught her eye. Squinting against the glare on the water, she leaned forward for a better view. A mass bobbed serenely, but there was something disquieting about it. Never taking her gaze off it, she turned and kept pace with it as it rode the current downriver. If it kept its course, it would float just past the far side of the bee. She ran the last few yards, hurried up the gangway, and dashed across the deck, leaning far out to see if she could get a better glimpse. There! It floated in a slash of glare, but would soon be in the clear water next to the ship. She watched it come. This close, it only took her a moment to recognize the shape for what it was. A dead body. She covered her mouth with one hand. The broken shaft of a spear protruded at an upward angle from the right shoulder. And when a whim of current turned the corpse, she saw it was an old man, face wrinkled, hair downy and white. Where had he come from? She glanced back up the river, and that was when she noticed the others drifting along. One was a small child of no more than three years. The others were all elderly. Dear father. She closed her eyes and pressed a hand to her stomach, willing down the rush of nausea. Someone stepped up beside her. Trent grunted, obviously having just noticed the corpse. He took her elbow and pulled her from the rail. I'm sorry you had to see that. Come away. Before she could form a reply, John Knight jogged up to them, puffing from the exertion. Captain, I reckon you ought to come see this. Trent's hand rubbed a slow, comforting circle against her back, and she stepped away from it. The man was too much of a temptation for her in a moment like this. Trent dropped his hands to his hips. What is it, John? It's the puddle, Captain. There's... With a glance at Ryan, he broke off and ended softly. There's something stuck in it, sir. Ryan's horror grew. She pressed her lips together and nodded to Trent that she would be fine. He should follow John, who was already heading back the way he had come. Ryan returned to her pallet next to June in the common room. She sank onto it, wrapping her arms about her knees and resting her forehead there. She rocked gently, willing the roiling in her stomach to settle, the pain in her heart to dissipate, but she was unsuccessful on both counts. They set off as soon as they had cleared the paddle. For the next three days, they had to pause repeatedly to remove bodies from the boat's wheel before they could resume their journey. It was mid-morning of the fourth day when they came upon the burned-out village. John woke Trent, and he took a crew of men ashore to see if there were any who needed help. They came back, faces grim, shaking their heads. There were no survivors. Ryan stood, hands resting on the deck rail, and watched the remains of the village slip behind the thick vegetation along the banks of the river as the boat slowly lumbered away. Had anyone tried to fight for those people? 
had anyone even spoken a word in their favour. The old man, the first corpse she had seen, had been killed from above. That was the only explanation for the angle of the spear. Had he been pleading for his life just before that fatal thrust? And what of those who'd been taken? Would they have been better off to have died? Who would help them now? Would anyone speak up for them along the way to Bagamoyo? Exhaustion overtook her. She wandered to the stern of the bee and settled into a cross-legged position on the deck, watching the Ruvuma trail away behind them. Maybe if she studied only the water directly in their way, she wouldn't have to see any more bodies, wouldn't have to contemplate any more painful questions that she didn't have the answers to, wouldn't have to wallow in the helplessness consuming her. Surely, someone needed to do something. But what could one person do? Papa said he felt called of the Lord to help these people. But what could he, in his weakened condition, do about such atrocities? She had no solutions. Such suffering. Such blatant disregard of humanity. As the days passed, Trent's frustration increased. The river grew narrower and narrower. Several times they came to impassable rocky shoals. The designs of the bee had taken this into account, however, and all along the side of the ship there were slots into which short poles could be fitted. When they came to the shallows, everyone disembarked, and all the men stepped into the water, fitted the poles in, and lifted the bee on their shoulders across the shallows, until the river became deep enough to once again float the ship. On the count of three, Trent counted off and with a collective grunt, the men hoisted the bee and moved forward fifteen paces. A rest of ten seconds, and the process repeated. Again! At one place where the river climbed a series of falls, they had to transport the ship on dry ground up the hill until they could reconnect with the water. Each new delay sent vexation coursing through Trent. With each destroyed village they passed, his resolve had grown. He needed to catch up to Khalifa and put a stop to his rampage, and find out who he's working for. And to do that, he might have to pretend he liked the man for a while. The very thought set his teeth on edge. Tonight he stood at the helm, keeping a keen eye on the lantern raised high from the canoe snaking through the river ahead of them. Well, keeping his eye on it most of the time. Ryan stood at the bow of the ship, moonlight gleaming off her dark curls as they billowed in the wind behind her beauty personified. He gritted his teeth and jerked his gaze back to the lantern, adjusting the course of the little steamer. Why couldn't she just go to her cot and sleep like everyone else? He was doing the right thing, keeping his distance from the lass. Khalifa's brutality had proven itself time and again over the past few weeks. And if the man ever had an inkling that Ryan meant something to Trent, he wouldn't hesitate to use her for leverage. If only Trent's heart would comprehend the message his head so clearly understood. He swallowed. Distance was what he needed. A great deal of distance between the alluring Miss Hunter and himself. But first he needed to get her and her father to their settlement. And this blasted river was not assisting him on that count. So it was with great relief, late one afternoon, that they discovered they'd come to the mouth of the river and could take the bee no further. Another fifty kilometres, and they would arrive at the village where Dr. Hunter had arranged to start his mission. Three more days. We'll have to walk from here, the captain's voice rang out loud and clear through the chilly morning mist. Ryan stood at the back of the group he had called together on the river bank just after dawn. Everyone, gather your packs and be ready to move out within the hour. Keiko estimates it won't take more than three days for us to reach his village from here. Ryan swallowed and glanced at Nyanja, leaning on her crutches. She had been doing very well for the past weeks, but her crutches would still slow her down. They'd need to make a rickshaw of sorts for her to be carried on. The wheels probably wouldn't work on the terrain they'd likely be facing. A litter, then. Ryan's gaze swept onto Papa, seated on a stone, his hands propped against his knees as though he needed their assistance to keep himself upright. 
as much as it pained her to admit it. She didn't think he'd make it fifty steps, even if he had nothing to carry. Her jaw clenched. Two litters, then. That was something she could orchestrate while the captain organized the rest of the party. She strode over to Keiko. I wonder if I might ask you to help me make two stretchers, one for Nianja and one for my father? Keiko bowed slightly and clapped his hands. It has already been accomplished, Miss Hunter. Captain Dawson gave the word last evening, and they have been made. He gestured to two canvas litters lying on the ground, a few paces to one side of the now dispersing group. Touched by the captain's thoughtfulness, she swallowed. Thank you, Keiko. Now all that remained was for her to talk Papa into making use of the assistance. She hurried to her father's side. How are you, Papa? Can I fetch you anything? His eyes were roomy when they met hers. I've already had tea this morning, thank you. And if you've come to try and talk me into using one of those blasted contraptions the captain had made a blast eve, then you could just take yourself right back to where you came from. Peak etched lines about his lips. She squatted down and rested one hand on his knee. Papa, you don't have the strength to walk for half an hour, much less all day. She was careful to keep her voice soft and undemanding. He sniffed. These legs have served me well for my entire life. I don't see the point in abandoning their use now. Besides, I dare say the fresh air and exercise will be a lot more healthy for me than the way you've kept me cooped up in that stuffy cabin all day long. He swept a disgruntled gesture to the little steamer that Trent's men were busily divesting of all conveyable items. Ryan dropped her gaze to the ground between her knees. His limitations were wearing on him, and how could they not? All his life he'd been healthy and independent, and now he was at the mercy of those around him for his care. Yet, despite his adamant wishes, she knew his strength would not sustain him for the arduous journey ahead, and she wanted nothing more than to see him reach the village especially now that they had come this far. So, how to convince him to make use of a litter? The captain strode by. Miss Hunter, a word if I may. He kept walking, not giving her opportunity to refuse. Ryan patted Papa's knee. I'll be back in a minute. Just rest. With that she rose and strode to where the captain waited for her, arms crossed over his chest. Yes, Captain? Whatever could he want with her? He hadn't spoken more than a few words in a row to her since the night he'd first returned from his inland jaunt. The captain held a pistol in a holster out toward her. I would like for you to wear this in the event that you might have need of it. Her eyes widened. It was one thing to go shooting with the captain. It was quite another to pack around one of his pistols on her hip. You and Papa have been able to force me into men's attire, Captain. But I assure you, I have not lost all my womanly sensibilities, and I'll not deign to carry a weapon like some... She rolled her hand through the air, frustrated that no ready comparison came to mind. Trollop, that's the word. Trollop in a London alley. His gaze flickered over her, and for a brief moment there was a hint of something remarkably close to humour reflected there. But before she could lambaste him about it, he turned to scrutinise his hustling crew, indifference dropping over his features. Very well. He draped the holster around his own hips and cinched it down. As for your father, we'll take it very slow this morning, under the guise of getting our travelling feet beneath us. A frown tensed her brow. I appreciate that, Captain. Thank you for letting me know. Though she had no idea why he was telling her, nor why there was need for pretense. Captain's gaze returned to hers, and then he practically rolled his eyes. Every man deserves to keep as much of his pride as possible. To the very end, Miss Hunter. Your father will be better served should he come to the conclusion on his own that travelling on one of the pallets will be best for all. Anger shot through her, swift and sure. She was only trying to do what was best for Papa. Oh, so you not only want me to abandon all the ways of civility, but you've been trained in medicine now as well, have you, Captain? He lifted his hands in a pose of surrender. I can see that you strongly resist my assessment in these matters, so I shall leave you to do as you see fit then. He strode toward the gangway, 
where two men were struggling to bring down a heavy trunk, throwing out as he departed. You might at least pause to consider what I've said about your father before you barge ahead in your stubbornness, however. Ryan huffed and would have retorted, but he was already giving instructions to the men that the trunk was not coming with them and should be returned aboard ship. She had every intention of ignoring the captain and badgering Papa to use one of the litters. However, as she marched back to Papa, it only took one glimpse of the dejected slump of his shoulders as he watched the frenzy all around him to realize that perhaps the captain was right. What would it be like, toward the end of life, to lose all her freedoms and abilities, when some day her children were helping her old and feeble bones down a path somewhere? Would she want them making harsh demands, or would she want them to give her a little space and as much dignity as her fragile state would in that moment allow her? A weight settled over her, but she knew what she needed to do. It didn't mean she was going to like it, however. Papa could walk for a little way, and then he'd realize he wasn't strong enough, and likely he'd ask to be carried on one of the stretchers, and all would be solved without her having to force his hand. Throwing her hands up in resignation, she turned toward the ship to gather her own meager accoutrements, along with Papa's pack, the least she could do would be to carry that for him. They departed within the hour, just as the captain had stated, and the path at first was rather smooth and well-worn. There must be villages nearby that used this trail to come to the headwaters of the Ruvuma for water. However, nary a native came to sight as their caravan progressed westward. Ryan made sure to stick close to Papa, and despite the fact that she could tell Trent had instructed his men to go slow, Papa's tortoise pace shuffle soon had them falling farther and farther behind the rest of the crew, even those men who were carrying Nyanja on one of the litters. Ryan resisted the pain and despair that threatened to drop her to her knees, right in the middle of the path. She rubbed the back of her neck, commanded herself to take hold of her emotions, and minced her steps so as not to tread on Papa's heels. But the memories could not be vanquished. When she was little, and Papa had been gone to Stone Town for one of his fortnight trips. She used to stand at the edge of the yard and watch for the first sign of his carriage returning to the plantation. The moment she'd glimpse him coming down the road, she would run to meet him. He'd invariably leave the carriage and instruct it to go on without him. He'd put her on his strong, broad shoulders, and they would spend fifteen blissful minutes, just the two of them, traipsing across the indigo fields toward home. Papa would spin her around until he collapsed to the ground in dizziness, and they'd both laugh until their sides ached. Ryan's vision blurred. Oh, how she missed the hearty, vibrant version of her papa, the man who was full of laughter and tricks, the man who'd protected her and taken care of her and snuck her sweets long after bedtime. Now he shuffled down the trail, his breath so labored she could hear every inhale and exhale like the tempo of a sad song. Surely at any moment now Papa would give in to reality and request to be carried, but his stubbornness held him fast to his course. Every few paces Papa stopped to cough, and every third or fourth time, Ryan took a moment to offer him water, and it was after one such halt mid-morning that she glanced up while stoppering her canteen to realize she could no longer see even the last member of their caravan. Goose flesh prickled the back of her neck. She surveyed the vast prairie surrounding them. Shoulder-height brown grasses swayed everywhere, and while the foot-worn trail was still plainly visible for the moment, what if they came to a place where it wasn't so obvious which way to go? Somewhere far out on the prairie, an animal barked a noise, half grunt, half growl, and the goose flesh turned to a chill that slithered down her spine. And once we are on our way, no straggling off from the main group. Lions will stalk a herd for hours, waiting for one to wander off alone, so they can pick it off. The captain's words of warning came back to her, as though he'd just spoken them to her this morning, and not several weeks ago, before they'd left the Commodore's estate. The grass here was so tall and thick. Would she even know if a lion was at this very moment creeping toward them? She took Papa's arm and tugged, urging him to his feet. We best try and catch up to the others, Papa. 
They'll be stopping for the nooning soon. Papa glanced around, seemingly for the first time, realizing that the two of them were alone. His lips pursed out, and he ran a tired hand down his grizzled face. I shouldn't have insisted on walking. I don't know what I was thinking. Nonsense. Now was not the time for recriminations, no matter how much she agreed with him. She nudged him forward, doing her best to keep her voice light. We'll catch up, but I think we'd best try not to stop again for a time. If only she hadn't listened to the captain's advice. Papa would be safely aboard a pallet at this very moment, and she would be surrounded by the comfort and safety of others. She glanced over the vast expanse of empty savannah and blue sky once more. Oh, why hadn't she at least given in to safety over propriety and accepted the gun the captain offered her? Perhaps when they caught up with the others, she would be able to talk him into relinquishing it to her. Because indeed, if she lived through this, she was going to kill the captain. And maybe a bullet from his own gun would be just the ticket to get her point across. Papa had only shuffled ten paces, and he was already huffing loudly. Ryan trod the path behind him, but a claw of apprehension kept reaching out to touch the base of her neck. Each time she cast a glance behind them, the path lay empty, but she couldn't shake the feeling that eyes were on them. Just a little farther, Papa. Papa tried to hurry, she could tell, but his breaths wheezed like a punctured bellows, and his steps faltered. He staggered to one side before catching himself and coming to a complete stop. It's okay, Papa. Just be still and breathe for a moment. Ryan's heart thudded in complete terror now. How long before the crew realized they were missing? Would the captain even send someone back for them? She was going to have to pack Papa on her back, or they were both going to die right here, probably eaten by some unsavory creature on the captain's list of animals to be most feared. After five minutes, when Papa's breaths had eased some, Ryan slipped the pack off her back and stepped over beside him. Okay, Papa, this is what we are going to do. You are going to hop on my back, and I'm going to carry you, until we can catch up with the others. It shouldn't be long before they stop to eat, and I think we'll catch up to them then. I'm sorry, daughter. I shouldn't have put us in this position in the first place. It's my stubborn pride that's put us here. Ryan wanted to assure him that this was all the captain's fault, but somehow she didn't think now was a good time to cast blame. Let's just catch up to the others, and this afternoon you can ride on a litter and rest, okay, Papa? He sighed again and glanced at the flat emptiness around them. Maybe you were right all along. Perhaps I should have stayed on the island and simply died in my bed. Now I've put you in danger. It was the defeat in the words that terrified her the most. If he gave up now, he might never reach his destination. Nonsense, Papa. If this is what you feel God called you to, then this is where you ought to be. She gritted her teeth, because what she ought to be doing was encouraging him to head back to Zanzibar with her this very minute. Yet she'd given that battle to God, or at least she'd tried to. And now she wanted to be a support to her father instead of a nag. So if he felt led to go to some village on the banks of a lake, who was she to stand in his way? She put her back to him and leaned slightly forward angling her arms backward, ready to take his weight. One jump, and then I will carry you. She braced herself to take the brunt of her father's weight, but before Papa even made a move, a whistle pierced the air. She glanced down the trail, hope burgeoning in her heart. The captain strode toward them, followed by four of his crewmen, one of whom carried one of the empty pallets. Relief nearly took all the strength from legs that had only a moment ago been prepared to go above and beyond their duty. Could use a lift, could you? The captain's words were dry. Ryan was torn between giving him a dressing down and throwing herself into his arms with gratitude that he'd come back for them. And since she couldn't decide which to do, she merely clamped her jaw shut and held her silence. The four natives helped Papa onto the stretcher, and then hoisted him between them and started down the trail. Ryan was suddenly trembling all over, head to foot, and when the captain started down the trail after his men, she momentarily lacked the strength to put one foot in front of the other. 
Placing one quavering hand to her forehead, she turned her back on the men and studied the trail behind them. She heard the captain's footsteps slow, and then still, and then return toward her. Are you well? Yes. Fine. No thanks to you. He stepped around until he could see her face. Concern etched the firm, stubborn line of his jaw. I'm sorry you fell so far behind. I should have noticed sooner. Or not asked me to let him walk in the first place. But she didn't say the words. Somehow, though berating him had seemed something to look forward to when the terror had been pulsing through her, now that he was here, she couldn't muster the will or the words. He unbuckled the holster with the pistol that he'd tried to give her that morning and held it out. Will you at least take this now? Just as she took the holster from him, Keiko stepped out onto the trail behind them. Is it okay if I join the others now, Mzi? he asked. Trent stilled, and his jaw jutted to one side as he studied Keiko for a moment, as though he really wished the man hadn't appeared just then. Trent's head didn't move, but his gaze angled back toward her in a way that made every intuition inside her leap to life with awareness. The eyes that she'd felt on them earlier. She stepped close and used both hands to slam the holster into the captain's chest. How could you? Trent took a step back, and his hands came up on reflex to cup her elbows. His attention never left her, as he calmly said. Yes. Thank you, Keiko. You may rejoin the others now. Keiko skidded around them and trotted down the trail after his companions. You planned this, Ryan tried to step back, but Trent firmed his hands and held her close. Only for your own good and that of your father. She tried to muscle free again, but all with no fruition and hardly any effort on the captain's part. In frustration, she smacked his chest with one balled up fist. He should have been on a pallet all morning instead of struggling along like he did. Indeed but that was his choice to make. I simply orchestrated to make the decision easier for him from this point on. Manipulation and deceit. She pummeled him with each word. His lower lip pooched out slightly, and he gave a small nod. I concede. His hands were still maddeningly gentle at her elbows. She tempered her tone. There would have been no need for manipulation if you had just left me to speak to him as we broke camp this morning. He tilted his head. Truly? You think you could have convinced your father, the same man who left behind his entire family, to head to the continent and die alone? And over much protestation from you, I might add, to lie placidly on a pallet and let others carry him, without him having proven to himself that his strength simply doesn't suffice any longer? The probable accuracy of his argument drained the stiffness from her shoulders. Maybe you are right. I don't know. I could have tried, but it doesn't matter now. What's done is done. Slowly, he took the holster she still held pressed to his chest from her hands. He swung it around her and buckled it securely over her hips. She gave him a withering glower. She really ought to stand by her refusal to wear it, simply because she knew her father wasn't the only one who'd been manipulated. The captain had purposely wanted her to wish she'd had the weapon. But the man ignored her look and simply lifted her pack to his shoulder and swept a gesture down the trail. Best we catch up to the others now, Miss Hunter. She reached for the bag. I can carry my pack, but he angled it away from her. I'll carry it for you, until we rejoin the others. Ryan threw her hands up in concession and tromped down the path ahead of him. The man was the most stubborn creature she'd ever met. Part Four That evening they slept on the open savannah with the sound of a lion roaring in the distance and the sharp bark of zebras to wake them at dawn. The next day torrential rain set in and they marched all day long, soaked to the skin. By the time a village came into view that evening, Ryan had never been so relieved to see a grass-roofed hut in all her life. And according to Trent, this was the last village they would need to stay in before they reached the one on the shore of the lake where Papa would build his mission. They only had a half a day's journey on the morrow, and they would be home. They were exhausted, the whole band of them. At the edge of the village, under the meagre shelter of some palms, their group came to a halt. 
With Keiko by his side, Trent stalked through the downpour toward the center of the village, tossing over his shoulder. Everyone wait here, and I'll see if I can find the headman. This will be a good place to make camp for the night. He didn't even glance her way, and Ryan pressed her lips together. Dipping one shoulder toward the ground, she let her pack slide off onto the toe of one of her boots to keep it out of the mud. She rubbed the sore muscles in her shoulders and rolled her head, feeling the release of tension all along her spine. She let out a sigh and glanced around the village. They'd passed through several during their inland trek along the river, and this one seemed more run down than the others, although thankfully she didn't see any signs of the brutality they had previously witnessed. The huts here were unkempt, the thatching tattered, and the walls crumbling in places. The gardens they had come through along the perimeter of the village had been in sore need of weeding, and the paths were unswept and littered with detritus and debris. A couple pens for holding cattle appeared to be one bovine kick away from total collapse, and the cattle were so thin she could count the ribs of the poor beasts from here. None lowed, they simply stood, heads hanging. The only sign that they even lived was an occasional swish of a tail. Trent returned a few moments later with a frustrated look gleaming in his eyes. The headman says we can stay, but we'll have to feed ourselves, and there is only one hut at our disposal. A grumble of surprise made the rounds of the soaking wet natives, and Keiko exclaimed something loudly to his companions in their native tongue. Trent turned to the man. What did you say? he asked in Swahili. Keiko shuffled his feet and glanced toward the village, licking his lips, eyes wide. He laid a hand over his chest. I am the son of the great chief of this area. The great chief resides in the village of our destination, along the banks of the great lake. This chief here, he indicated the village before them. He is an underheadman. It is a great insult that he does not offer proper hospitality to the great chief's son, but an even greater offense not to offer it to strangers. He jutted his chin forward, anger glimmering in his gaze. My father will know of this before the sun is set tomorrow. They made out the best they could for dinner, and after they had eaten, Trent led the way to the little hut the headman had offered for their use. A fire burned in a pit in the middle of the floor, a smoke rising up to dissipate through a small hole at the peak of the conical roof. Ryan hovered over the flames for a moment as the captain helped Papa get settled on a cot. She was thankful that the room was at least warm and dry. Cold seemed to have seeped into her very bones, despite the fact that the rain had been rather warm throughout the day. She worried about Papa. He looked paler this evening. She crossed to him and settled one hand on his forehead. He was much too hot, and his breaths barely brushed the back of her hand when she held it before his mouth. She worried her teeth over her lower lip. Would he make it through the night? Should she try to remove his damp clothes, or simply let him rest? In the end, she decided on the latter, for he already looked to be well on his way to sleep and the warmth of the fire would soon have his damp clothing dry. The captain said something quietly to June, and Ryan lifted her head. Nianja's, Moyo's, and June's cots spanned the rest of the perimeter, and her own pallet took up the last remaining space by the door in the little room. The door of the hut was nothing more than a rectangle cut into the wall. There was no actual door. The roof seemed to be holding most of the rain out, but was in disrepair just above the door outside, and the rain was slanting so that it would come right into the room. Bugs would also have free rain over them tonight if she didn't do something about that. From her pack, she pulled a small roll of twine. She scanned the roof. Now, if she could just reach the poles that held the thatching aloft, she could create a clothesline of sorts to hang a section of canvas from. That should keep at least some of the wet and bugs at bay. Trent stepped to her side and took the ball of twine without so much as asking what she planned. He seemed to be able to read her thoughts. Standing on his toes, he tied one end of the twine to one of the poles and then stretched it tight over to another, just on the other side of the doorway. Pulling a knife from his boot, he sliced off the twine and handed the ball back to her without a word. When he had finished tying off the string, she stepped forward with the length of canvas and he helped her hang the cloth. It wouldn't be perfect, but it would be better than nothing. 
she felt pity for the captain and his men, who would be hard-pressed to find any sleep in the conditions outside. Trent stepped back and gestured to the canvas with a slight bow in her direction, and a distinct glimmer in his gaze, as though he just built a bridge to help her cross a puddle. She couldn't help but smile a little at his theatrics. Thank you, Captain. He tipped her a nod, and his gaze darted to Papa, his expression all seriousness now. I'll be right outside. Call me if you need anything. Ryan followed his gaze, worry once again rising to the fore of her mind. Would Papa make it? He'd come so far, yet. Realizing her attention had wandered from the captain, she turned to thank him again, but he was already out the flap of canvas and hidden by the darkness. With a sigh, she collapsed onto her pallet. Slowly she relaxed, and the exhaustion from the day's trek faded the world into the fuzzy haze of sleep. She didn't know how long she'd been asleep when a sound outside her heart woke her with a jolt. She sat upright and looked around, blinking the fog from her thoughts. The rain had stopped, she realized, but all was silent. June, whose pallet lay next to hers, was also sitting up, her eyes wide and white in the darkness. And that's when Ryan took note of the voices. Two men behind their hut, speaking in low tones. Ryan could not understand the Chewa they spoke, but the gaps between the mud walls and the thatched roof left their words clearly audible. Ryan leaned toward June. What are they saying? she whispered softly. June held up one hand and cocked her head to continue listening. While June listened, Ryan slipped quietly from her cot and crossed the room to check on Papa. Papa's skin was still much too warm, but at least his breaths were a little stronger this time and his clothing seemed to have dried. There was not much more she could do for him but let him sleep. After several moments of continued conversation, the men outside quieted and footsteps could be heard moving away from their hut. June turned to her with wide eyes. What is it? Kiko, he has invited any who want to leave this village and their lazy chief to come and take shelter in his father's village. He told them to be ready to leave with us at first light. That's good. These people need some help. Good, yes. But wars? They start over less, no? The chief, Juan Kulu, will not let his people go without a fight? Ryan swallowed and eased back onto her cot. Suddenly, she bolted upright. We should tell the captain. I heard. Go back to sleep, Miss Hunter. His voice rose from just outside the canvas partition, so it was no wonder he'd overheard her conversation with June, close as they were to the door. Miss Hunter, she suddenly realized, he hadn't called her Ryan once since that moment they'd shared at the mango tree. And on top of that realization came the recognition over how much she missed the sound of her name on his lips. With a sigh, she lay back against her cot. She must think on something else, I never sleep another wink this night. Her thoughts turned once more to Papa. If he didn't wake come morning, what would she do? Would she travel ahead to the village Papa so longed to reach? Or would she turn back from here? She pressed finger and thumb to her eyes to stem the tears. This too was a subject she ought not to think too long on if she wanted more sleep. She punched her pack into a more comfortable pillow. Braden. She would think on Braden Harcourt and what answer she would give to his proposal the next time she saw him. The trouble was, when she closed her eyes, it wasn't the vision of the man with blonde hair and impish blue eyes that came to mind, but of the one with dark curls and green-gray eyes that held the power to stay her breath. She gritted her teeth and flopped onto her side. It seemed her thoughts had come full circle. Trent rose with the sun as it crested the horizon with prompt equatorial precision just after the five o'clock hour. Steam lifted in misty wisps off every rain-damp surface. The birds had been awake since the first hint of light had touched the sky, and the chorus they raised could almost be labelled a racket, were it not so beautifully harmonic. Trent gingerly gripped the rim of a scalding tin of the local tea, 
He would need the aid of the bitter black brew to power him through this day, since he doubted he'd slept more than two hours in snatches throughout the night. Sand seemed to lie in the backs of his eyelids this morning. The villagers began to trickle into a small open area, just outside the village proper, with bundles and packs. One child carried a pot balanced on her head, and mothers had babies strapped to their backs, but none of them carried more than a handful of worldly possessions. He gritted his teeth. The last thing he wanted to do was start a war with this chieftain. Yet how could he deny these people a chance at a better life? Of course they were going to accept the invitation of the great chief's son to join his father's village, which according to all Trent had heard of the place, was thriving and well run. Still, adding so many to their ranks was sure to affix time to their journey. He took in the number of women with small children strapped to their backs and sighed. Likely they'd be pushing dusk at this rate. He'd wanted to arrive in plenty of time to get the hunters settled in a good hut and ensure their safety so that he could take off promptly at dawn on the morrow to find Khalifa. One more delay, he grimaced. Each delay could cost people's lives. Ryan emerged from the hut behind him, supporting her father, one of his arms draped over her shoulders. By the looks of her drooping eyes and the stretch of her yawn, it didn't appear she'd gotten much more sleep than he had. Hurrying ahead of her, Trent readied her father's conveyance. He worked the inside of his lip, as he watched Ryan ease the old man down onto the sail-turned stretcher. It was a miracle the doctor had made it this far. As June assisted Nyanja onto the other pallet, Trent's gaze honed in on Ryan, where she leaned over her father, fussing to settle a light blanket around his shoulders. At least the doctor had made it through the night. From what he'd seen of him the night before, he'd had his doubt. What was he going to do with Ryan if the doctor passed away before he had all the information he needed about Khalifa? She wouldn't be safe all alone in the village. Downing one last swallow, he tossed the grounds of his tea into the grass and forced himself to turn from her. He would deal with that when the time came. Squatting down, he began thrusting everything into his pack, but his attention once again fixed on the villagers still trickling into the field. One of the village women was very pregnant, and she had a tiny girl cinched to her back and a goat leashed with a rope trotting by her side. The goat bleated a protest when the woman pulled it away from a plant it wanted to nibble on. Ryan rushed to the woman's side and stretched her hands out, offering to carry the child for her. The villager seemed unsure whether to accept the white woman's help, but June stepped over and spoke a few words. With a nod of understanding, the woman untied the cloth holding the baby to her and pulled the child around to her front and held her out to Ryan. The babe was totally naked. Ryan held the child at arm's length and glanced from it to the path they would need to travel today and back. The look on her face would have made a humorous good money at a circus sideshow. Trent bit back a grin and quickly schooled his features as he strapped his hunting knife to his belt. Hesitantly, Ryan pulled the child closer, examining her from head to toe as though she might find some diaper cloth hidden somewhere on the little body. Trent could almost see the cogs turning in her head. She was obviously trying to decide how to avoid several good soakings during the day's trek. The babe was still held a good ways from her body when she glanced over and caught him watching her. He raised one eyebrow and grinned at her. This was one predicament she could get herself out of. Lifting her chin, she wrapped the blanket carefully around the little one, pulled it close, and settled it on her hip. She quirked an eyebrow at him, and then presented him with her back, as she reached to sling her pack over one shoulder. Trent laughed aloud. Her pride would receive its just reward many times over by the end of the day, he was sure. A yell drew his attention and sent a bolt of unease down his spine that erased all traces of humor. A corpulent man rushed into the clearing from the direction of the village. Even at this distance, Trent recognized him as the headman he'd spoken to the day before. He jolted upright. This would not be good. The man rushed straight for the pregnant woman standing next to Ryan, yelling at the top of his lungs. He grabbed the woman by her upper arm and shook her like a dog might shake a snake. She must be his wife. Trent shoved past a group of villagers, just joining the crowd, and jogged toward Ryan through the milling throng of people. 
He leapt over a basket of maize and dodged the back end of a hump-shouldered cow a young boy prodded with a sharpened goad. The chief leaned over the pregnant woman, yelling in her face and cowing her until she covered her head with both arms. Trent pushed through a group of several women who had paused to watch the spectacle. The chief suddenly noticed the babe in Ryan's arms. He lunged for her, grabbed Ryan by one arm and jerked her closer, screaming so angrily that spittle exploded from his mouth with each word. Ryan's eyes were wide with a fear that shot Trent through with red-hot anger toward the man. Trent was too far away to protect her. Why had he let her wander so far from his side this morning? Ryan tried to jerk loose of the man, which jostled the baby, who burst into loud wails of terror. The pregnant woman hung on the headman's arm, crying and begging, and by her postures and gestures, promising to return to the village with him. That was when Trent noticed the knife in the chief's hand the knife arcing toward Ryan's torso and the gleam of hatred in the chief's eyes. Ryan! Trent hurdled a small hand-pushed cart and shucked his colt from its holster. The man was too close to Ryan to chance the shot. Trent fired into the air as he leapt over a log lying in his path. The sound of the shot had its intended effect. The chief rose for a moment, glancing around to see where the sound had come from. The man's eyes widened as he focused on Trent barreling toward him, gun extended. He let go of Ryan's arm and stepped back, dropping the knife on the ground by his feet and holding his hands wide, palms forward. Trent stopped when he was only an arm's length from the man, stepping between the chief and Ryan, who still clutched the screaming baby. Trent pulled in a steadying breath, willing his heart rate to return to normal, never taking his eyes off the chief who he suddenly realized was swaying unsteadily on his feet. Ryan, are you well? Behind him, she shushed and cooed to the baby. Yes, I'm fine. Trent met the man's gaze, jerked his chin back toward the village, and gestured with the point of the gun that the chief should return from whence he'd come. The man's chin lifted and his gaze grew more fierce. He slurred some words low and angry and pointed to the general direction of the child in Ryan's arms. Trent swallowed. Like it or not, the woman and child were obviously this man's family. Ryan, maybe you should give the baby back to its mother, he heard her gasp. But Captain, that man is terrible. We can't make them go back to him. The chief's wife still cowered with her head curled into her arms. Trent took in the scars all over her arms and shoulders. He gritted his teeth. Ryan was right, and the woman was clearly terrified of her husband. Left to her own decisions, she would likely go back with the man. It had probably taken every ounce of courage she'd had to try and escape him this morning. June, Trent called over his shoulder without taking his eyes or his aim off the man. He heard her steps, but she stopped just behind him and only slightly off to one side. Tell this man that if he makes one move to follow us, I will shoot him. And tell the woman that she can come with us, and we will protect her. She no longer needs to fear this man. June swallowed audibly, and then spoke a few tremulous words. The chieftain growled and lurched toward Trent. The menace was taken out of the action when he nearly lost his footing and had to flap his arms like a man on a floating log to regain his balance. He muttered an indecipherable protestation just before his knees buckled. His eyes rolled back in his head and he slumped to the ground. His wife studied him carefully for a long moment and then she skittered around his prostrate form and hurried to gather her still wailing girl from Ryan's arms. Trent squatted down and felt the man's pulse thready and erratic. Were he merely drunk, his pulse should be stronger. The woman had obviously drugged him with something this morning. He called over two of his guides and bade them haul the unconscious man back to his hut. The man might not live past whatever she'd poisoned him with, but at least he would die in his own bed. When he stood, the woman was looking at him over the top of the now silent baby's head. She said a few words, and Trent glanced at June for the interpretation. She says he will not die, only sleep for a rotation of the sun. He nodded his understanding and took Ryan's elbow, leading her back toward her father. What does a man have to do 
to keep you from finding trouble, Miss Hunter. Her only response was a huff of irritation as she jerked her elbow from his grasp. He couldn't resist the smile that pulled at his mouth as he watched her fall in with the group that had begun to shuffle down the trail. But his smile faded as he observed his men, with the chief slung between them, disappear into a hut. He had a feeling they'd not seen the last of the headman. Jasmine Hunter sat on the piano bench in the parlor of the Stonetown residence. She closed her eyes and let her fingers drift over the notes on the keyboard. Drawing in a long, slow breath, she poured all the frustration she was feeling into the music. With Rory off at the plantation house on the other side of the island, she and Mama were in danger of becoming two cats in a bag. She missed Ryan. And despite Mama's constant complaints about how selfish she'd been to run off with Papa, she knew Mama missed her too. And Papa, tears pricked at the backs of Jasmine's eyes and she let two mournful minor notes duel with each other. Papa had claimed he would only be gone for six months, yet Ryan had left a note, found after she'd already stowed away and departed on Captain Dawson's boat, that claimed she thought Papa was more ill than he'd been letting on, and so she'd gone after him. Was Papa really sick? And if so, why would he go into seclusion like that and keep them from being with him during his last days? Certainly, it would be difficult to watch him dying, but wasn't that what family was for? To help each other through the hard times? Surely Papa would need them all? She suppressed a sob and leaned over the keyboard, tilting her head to take in the plaintive high notes juxtaposed to the thunder of the low ones. If only for the fact that Papa would have family with him during his last days, she was glad Ryan had run off to be with him, and Captain Dawson would take care of her. A hint of a smile tugged at the corner of her mouth as she remembered the way Captain Dawson had hovered outside Ryan's room after the ball that night she'd collapsed. He'd nearly paced a trench until they were certain nothing too serious was wrong. Only once Ryan had fallen into a restful sleep had he left his post outside her door. Yes, Captain Dawson was a good man who would take care of Ryan and make sure she came home safely. And then there was the captain's oaf of a first mate, Garrett Holloman. The man hadn't even bidden her farewell before heading off to the continent to seek his fortune with his cousin. The last time she'd seen him had been during their second dance at the ball. She banged out the notes a little more forcefully. So much for a second dance meaning anything anymore. Behind her, the clock on the mantel chimed eight o'clock. She was to meet Bishop Tozer at the mission in thirty minutes. Today would be her first day as teacher to the orphans in his care. Nervousness had prodded her wide awake just before the five o'clock hour. Many of her students had been rescued from the ocean after they'd grown sick and were dumped overboard by slavers. Several different tribes and languages would be represented. It was going to prove challenging, of a certainty, to teach the little mites. But she couldn't think of anything that had excited her this much since Papa had given her Mabel, her first pony on her seventh birthday. Movement between the music rack and the top board of the grand piano caught her attention. Mama swept into the parlor, wringing her fingers, cheeks flushed and a glimmer of indecipherable emotion in her eyes. Jasmine's hands fell into her lap. What is it? Mrs. Corbel has just sent her servant over to let us know. The wasp sailed into the harbor late last night. A knock sounded at the front door, even as Mama finished her sentence. Excitement trilled through Jasmine. Papa and Ryan had come home. Lifting her skirt, she hurried across the parlor toward the entry. Jasmine heard Sarah unlock and open the heavy door just before she rushed from the parlor into the entryway. Papa! The word she'd intended died in her throat. Garrett Holloman stood on the front steps, slouch hat in hand, a grim hardness clenching his jaw. Her excitement guttered and died, even as a rebellious thrill of another sort traipsed through her. His golden hair had grown since she'd seen him last. It curled just over his collar and ears, and he was dressed for calling. His bronze long jacket cut away from the ruffle of his cravat, and the trim fit of his slacks to reveal his knee-height black boots with brass buttons. She swallowed. 
He looked as good as ever, but no one else accompanied him. No one. Oh, Officer Holloman. She licked her lips, studying him. Surely he was here to tell them Papa had passed on. But where was Ryan? He gave a slight bow, acknowledging her lame greeting. Miss Hunter. She peered behind him, but still no one else had emerged. Sarah, still holding the door open, cleared her throat softly, and Garrett shuffled his feet, a hint of humor ticking up one corner of his mouth. Realization jolted through Jasmine. She'd left him on the step for a dreadfully long time. Oh, where are my manners? Do come in, please. She swept a hand toward the parlor. Mama is waiting for you. He strode through the portal, but instead of passing by and on into the parlor, stopped directly in front of her. His warm blue gaze swept over her face, and a crinkle of pleasure edged one eye. Your father was doing well when I left the party, Miss Hunter. Not improved, but still very much alive. A breath of relief eased from her, and she nodded, pressing her lips together. Thank you for telling me quickly. His chin dipped in a very slight nod, but for the longest time he stood still, his gaze roaming her face. She held her breath, unsure how to assess the emotions coursing through her. Finally, he glanced down, twisted his hat a couple times, and then stepped past her to lead the way into the parlor. Mama, seated on the settee in the sunlight, streaking through the far window, rose when they entered. Officer Holloman, what a pleasure to see you again. She pressed her palms together. I fear the news you bring us won't bode well, however. Garrett bowed over Mama's hand. Perhaps not as ill as you fear, madame, yet likely not as happy as you hope. Mama gestured him toward the chair across from the settee as Jasmine took the space by Mama's side. Do give us the good news first, then, will you? Garrett eased into the proffered chair and hung his hat on one knee. As I've just told Miss Hunter, your husband still lived when last I saw him. However, he cleared his throat and fiddled with the leather thong tied around the base of his hat. His health was not improved either. He reached into an inside pocket of his coat. I've brought letters to you from your daughter, and one from your husband also, conveying his wish that I stand in as your protector here in Stonetown until such a time as, he coughed uncomfortably, I am no longer needed. Mama studied the letters Garrett held out to her, her lips pinched together, and Jasmine could tell she was holding tears at bay. Jasmine reached over and took the missives. Thank you. A muscle bunched in his jaw, but he made no reply, only nodded in acknowledgement. The top letters were addressed to Mama, one in Ryan's swirly script and the other in Papa's barely legible scrawl. There was a letter to Rory, and the last envelope was addressed to Jasmine. She set Rory's on the table and handed Mama hers before she broke the seal on her own letter and pulled the onion skin page from within. Jazzy, I hope you can forgive me for running off the way I did without letting you in on my plan. I know you'll understand that Papa needs me, is going to need me even more in these his last days. And I couldn't risk mother, or papa for that matter, somehow finding out what I intended. I know you never would have told them. The more who knew, the more likely they would have sent something amiss. I won't honeycoat the truth. Papa is not long for this world. His cough has grown worse, I fear, over the last few days. I've tried everything I can think of to get him to come home, all to no avail. We leave on the morrow, for the lake Papa is so set on reaching before his death. I will write in my journal every day, so that when we find ourselves together again, you and Rory, maybe Mother too if she wants, will have the benefit of reading the first-hand account of Papa's last days. I will send word with any news as soon as I can. All my love, always. Ryan. Jasmine blinked rapidly to hold her tears at bay as she folded the page and put it back in the envelope. So all was just as she'd suspected. She'd never see Papa again. A wave of despair threatened to overwhelm her, but one thing held her steady. Mama would need her to be strong. 
They would go on as though nothing were out of the ordinary until they heard otherwise. Then they would have decisions to make. The clock chimed the quarter hour, and Jasmine realized how late the time had grown. Mama, her letter still unopened and clutched in one fist, watched the bird of paradise swaying in the flower bed outside the window. Jasmine leaned over and kissed Mama on the cheek. I need to hurry along. She stood, and ever the gentleman, Officer Holloman, rose with her. Mama acknowledged her words with a flutter of her fingers and an almost imperceptible nod of her head. Her gaze never left the yard. Jasmine curtsied to the man across from her. If you'll excuse me, sir. Thank you for the news and the letters. I'm sure I'll be seeing you around town, of a time. Not giving him opportunity to respond, she started from the room. But she could hear him keeping pace behind her. Suppressing a huff of indignation, she gritted her teeth. She needed to be able to concentrate on her students' lessons, especially today of all days. She couldn't have him tagging along and distracting her. Irritation washed through her. She shouldn't even be distracted by the man, who obviously felt so little for her that he'd gone off to the continent without so much as a fairly well. In the entry, she paused and faced him as she pulled on her day gloves. Officer Holloman? So it's back to officer, is it? I thought we were past that. She ignored the cajoling in his tone and jerked her gloves firmly into place. Officer Holloman, I have classes to teach and I don't want to be late. So, if you'll excuse me. She reached for the door, but he leaned past her and beat her to it, his hand wrapping around the handle just before hers did. Instead of pulling it open, he stopped and looked down at her, waiting. She cast him a glance of irritation. Decided humor danced in his azure eyes. Humor and curiosity. Her chin lifted as her peak grew. One of his eyebrows winged its way upward. I can see that I've somehow upset you. She resisted a snort and studied a spot on the doorframe. The man didn't even realize his faux pas. I'm going to be late. Lips pinched, she flicked him another glance. A muscle at the corner of his eye ticked but he pulled the door open and stepped back out of her way. Good day, then, Miss Hunter. Thankfully, Azim had the carriage ready and waiting down on the drive. And to you also, Officer Holloman. She swept past him, descended the stairs, and allowed Azim to assist her into the carriage. But as she settled her skirts, she couldn't resist one last glance back toward the house. Garrett stood on the top step arms folded and leaning back into his heels, a frown of consternation on his brow. She sat back with a huff. Let the man be confused. He deserved a little angst after leaving the way he had. Garrett watched the carriage disappear around the corner, puzzled by the lady's sudden lack of warmth toward him. He scratched the back of his head and ambled down the stairs to the drive his gaze still on the spot where the carriage had disappeared. What had changed between the last time he'd seen her and now? Had another suitor come along where he was away to the continent? His teeth banged together. The least she could do was tell him straight out. But no, she had to go and be all coy and uppity. He pushed out a breath of irritation. So much for the silver tea service he'd had that Steve Dorr friend of Trent's deliver from the docks along with his parting letter the morning they'd set sail. He'd spent a good amount of coin on it. He laughed derisively at himself. He'd even paid extra to have that cluster of jasmine blooms engraved on it. She probably enjoyed a good laugh at his sentimentality. He kicked a pebble lying in his path and tromped back toward his quarters. It was going to be a long few weeks. Part 5 Ryan heard the waters of the lake and smelled the sweet scent of it in the air before they crested the top of the last hill and saw the vast glistening expanse. Ryan closed her eyes and tipped her face directly into the refreshing breeze. They had made it. Papa had made it. Even now he stood, albeit shakily, beside her. Thank you, Father. Tears of relief stung for just a moment. Papa pulled in an unsteady breath and murmured, Father, 
in heaven above. You've preserved me and brought me here. May I serve these precious people, whom you love, with fervor and joy. She opened her eyes and smiled at the joyous expression on Papa's face, before she turned to study the village that would be home for the foreseeable future. The lake had a surprisingly expansive beach with white sands that stretched as far as her gaze could travel in either direction. Along the horizon, a faint blue outline of the land across the water stamped a ragged line against the sky. From their vantage point on the hill above, she could see that the village huts were set a smart distance from the waves licking the sandy beach. The sun hung low on the horizon, and early evening dusk smudged the valley. Smoke rose from chimneys, and from one of the dwellings the low rhythm of drums could be heard. As villagers went, this one was likely the most prosperous one she'd seen since leaving the coast. The huts were arranged in large concentric half-circles with the flat diameter of the circle spread out along the beach. One hut at the centre was twice and a half again the size of the rest. It, and every hut both north and south of it along the beach, would have a wonderful view of the water from their doorways. Gardens stretched along the inland perimeter of the huts, green and vibrant. Coconut palms swayed in the breeze near the water, while other fruit trees grew in several locations throughout the village. A corral full of long-horned, hump-shouldered cattle stood to one side of the village, and small pens of goats and chickens lay scattered throughout behind various huts. Trent stepped up beside them. We need to go. She gritted her teeth. The man was in such a hurry to get them settled and rush off. She wanted to lash out at him, but all she said was, Come, Papa. She helped him back onto his pallet, thankful to feel that at least for the moment his fever seemed to be abated. She took up position at one of the corners herself, indicating to the man who had been at the post that he was free to go. Trent motioned for the other three men to wait and stepped to her side. I'll take it. I can do it. I'll be fine. He brushed her back and shouldered his way in front of her and grabbed the pole. You'll blister your hands, and I won't be around to doctor you. She glanced down at her hands. She'd been helping to carry Papa off and on all day while Trent had been farther ahead in the entourage guiding their path. Blisters already covered the palm of her right hand. She held it up for him to see. I've been helping to carry him all day. A muscle bunched in his jaw, and he cast a scathing look at the three men at the other corners. I told you, Lot, not to let her help. Ryan lifted her chin. Yes, so they said. I simply reminded them who has been cooking their meals each night. Trent grimaced. Ryan, if one of those should burst and become infected. The worry in his tone sent a tremor through her, and she stepped back, acquiescing to his wishes. She swallowed. I'll be fine, I'm sure. I've survived for many years without you to take care of me, so no need to worry. Without another word, he picked up the corner of the pallet and started down the hill toward the village. June and Keiko had run ahead, and already the villagers were pouring from their huts and rushing to line the path into the village. The drummer was there, and a low song started at one end and grew as more and more villagers lined the way. They clapped and danced and sang in joyous abandon, obviously ecstatic to receive home some of their own and the visitors accompanying them. Moyo ran to Ryan's side, her eyes wide with wonder and a touch of fear at the loud song and undulating people. Ryan lifted her and fell in behind the captain. The smoky scent of cook fires filled the valley and added to the hazy pall of dusk. Their entourage wound through the wriggling body-lined path to the centre of the village and came to a stop in front of the largest hut, where a man with a thick iron bracelet, decorated with copper, sat on a carved ebony chair. His hair was braided into many plates that hung down to his shoulders, and red clay had been used to mark a pattern on his right cheek and across one bare shoulder and part of his chest. Trent lowered Papa to the ground and then dropped to one knee before the chief. Keep your head lower than his, he said in a voice likely only she heard. With a quick glance around, even as she curtsied to follow his orders, 
Ryan realized that everyone in the vicinity kept their head lower than that of the chief, seated on his black throne. The chief welcomed them to his village, and at first, despite the fact that Ryan knew Keiko was his son, didn't seem any happier to see him than the rest of them. However, later, as they were all shown to various huts, she did notice that Keiko's lay much closer to the center of the village, and thus the chief's own dwelling, than most of their groups, except for her and Papa's. The chief gave them the highest honor of the hut directly next door to his, on the north side, after he displaced two of his wives to another, a little further away. Despite being evicted, the women looked none too upset as they exited with their meager belongings, even smiling at her as she waited to one side with Papa and Wuyu. The inside of the dwelling hung thick with smoke from the fire a few feet outside the door. With the wind blowing off the lake, the smoke wafted right through the doorway and filled the room in a nearly choking cloud. What had those women been thinking? No way could Papa sleep with all that in there. He was already bent double, coughing. Come, Papa, she took his arm. Back outside for just a minute. Outside, she eased Papa down with his back to the warm mud wall and his face to the lake and the setting sun. As soon as she was sure he was as comfortable as she could make him for the moment, she sent Moyo to June, who was visible just down the beach, and then set about putting out the fire, which of course only created more smoke at first. But when she finally extinguished the last of each smoking ember, she returned to the inside of the hut and set about trying to remove the smoke from the interior. There was a short grass broom leaning next to the door, a thick bunch of long blades folded in half and then bound tightly just below the fold to create a handle of sorts. She picked that up and set to shooing at the smoke, but only seemed able to swirl the roiling mass, not wafted out the door. Why didn't this hut have a hole at its peak like the one they'd stayed in last night? After fifteen minutes she was panting and sweating, and despite the fact that she'd now retrieved one of her petticoats from her bag to flap at the smoke, hadn't managed to clear the air even a tiny bit. With a growl of frustration, she chucked the broom into one corner and her petticoat atop her valise, then propped her hands on her hips and glowered at the hazy cone-shaped ceiling. Behind her, Trent chuckled. She spun around, wide-eyed. How long had he been watching her? He stood in the doorway, arms folded, trim hips and broad shoulders clearly outlined against the crimson and gold sunset splashing across the sky and lake behind him. His face was in shadow, so she couldn't read his expression, but a glint of humor twinkled in his eyes. A gentle breeze ruffled his shirt and hair. She swallowed and returned her attention to the ceiling. So he'd come to say goodbye, like she'd known he would. She pushed away the worry fisting her stomach at the thought, and couldn't even muster up any anger to throw his way for sneaking up on her. She hadn't seen which hut he'd been given by the chief, but knew that regardless which it was, he wouldn't be needing it for long. So, you've come to say your farewells? His feet scraped against the ground, but when she looked at him, he still stood in the doorway. That, and to tend your hands. Come outside. Give the breeze fifteen minutes to do its work, and the hut will be as smoke-free as you'll ever get it with all that commotion and bluster of yours. She glowered at him and waved a hand toward the hazy interior. Papa can't sleep in these conditions. He nodded. Fifteen minutes. The breeze picks up in the evenings off the lake, but later when it dies down, the mosquitoes come out in droves. They, he tipped his head in the general direction of the village, prefer the smoke. To the bugs. Understanding dawned, so the fire had been strategically placed to fill the hut with smoke and ward off the mosquitoes. She brushed past him, pulling in a full breath of the fresh, sweet air coming off the lake. My hands are fine. I need to find Papa something to eat. Trent captured her hand, stilling her, and nodded toward her father. June already squatted before him, a bowl of broth in one hand and a spoon in the other. Papa held a corn cake in one trembling hand and slowly took bites between spoonfuls of broth. June glanced up, and Ryan nodded her thanks. One corner of June's mouth lifted as she returned the gesture. Trent still held her hand in his, and now his thumb stroked a warm trail 
that swept a tingle of awareness across her skin. Her eyes flew to his. There was an ember of heat gleaming in his gaze that fanned her awareness into blatant desire. And she snatched her hand back to her side, lest she throw herself into his arms and beg him not to leave. He settled into a relaxed stance, thumbs hooked into his belt, and his gaze kept her captive. I'll only be gone a few days, two weeks at the most. She clenched her jaw, crossed her arms, and forced herself to study the sunset across the way. I'm not your keeper. Take all the time you want. A small puff of impatience escaped his lips, and he reached out and unfolded her arms, tugging her blistered palm into the space between them. He studied the angry red swords, but the light was fading quickly, and it only took a second for him to release her hand and stride back toward the village, tossing over his shoulder. Wait here. He was back in a moment with Keiko and a lantern. Arching his brows, he held one hand out, palm up, and waited this time for her to place her hand in his. With a sigh of reluctance, she complied. She might as well appease him, for in his stubbornness he would just hound her until she conceded. But she wasn't looking forward to the harangue she was about to receive. One of the blisters had broken open only a few minutes ago when she was trying to clear the smoke with the broom. She was right that it only took him a moment to notice the split skin, but the chastisement she'd feared did not materialize. Trent glanced at Keiko. Can you fetch the doctor's bag from inside the hut, please? Yes, Mzi. Ryan held her breath, still expecting a lecture. But to her consternation, the man simply retrieved a pot that sat next to the door and strode down to the lakeshore to fetch some water. The village here had employed the same type of fencing Trent's men had used while traveling along the river to gate off a segment of the lake for safety, she noted. June had finished with Papa now, and Ryan noticed her helping Nyanja get some exercise with her crutches. Little Moyo trotted along behind them, clapping chubby hands and chattering a mile a minute. Ryan smiled softly, love for the sweet girl swelling her chest. And then there was June. Such a jaunty woman, always going out of her way to help and do for others. She had to be near exhaustion. Ryan made a note to try and take on more duties so June would be freed up a little more. Papa seemed perfectly content. His face tipped into the last golden rays of the sun, so she let him sit quietly for the moment. Keiko returned with Papa's medical bag. Thank you, Keiko. I'm sure you are tired. You may go if you like, but leave the lantern, please. Captain Dawson will need it again. Aye, madam. He gave a little bow of deference and set the lantern on the ground near her feet. June and Nyanja had stopped after only a few paces and turned back. Nyanja was probably too tired tonight after the day's long trek. Ryan eyed the stump of Nyanja's still bandaged leg as the woman headed toward the hut they would be sharing down to the south a ways. Ryan would need to check that before she slept tonight. The golden orb of the sun hung low in the sky, the bottom lip of its circumference just kissing the surface of the water along the horizon. Out over the water, a large fish eagle, only a charcoal silhouette against bright light, dove feet first into the water and emerged with an unlucky fish dangling from its claws. Near her, the leaves of several tall palms rattled together, in the gentle breeze coming off the lake. Trent trudged her way, the pot filled with water now. Her gaze wandered past him to the fence in the lake. As Trent stopped at her side, she asked him, why didn't the village near Commodore Cornwall's place have a fence like that in place, do you think? There probably was one normally, but it had rained straight through for a couple days before, if you recall. The fence likely washed away, or the river rose so high the crocs just swam over it. Ryan sighed. I wish I could have done more for her. He gestured for her to sit on a large rock to the side of the fire pit, and, when she complied, held out the pot of water, motioning for her to wash. She lowered her blistered hand into the coolness. Pain zinged through her palm when the water seeped into the open blister, and she bit back a wince. But after only a moment, the sharpness of the pain eased. 
and the refreshing water actually felt good. While she soaked her hand, Trent dug through the medical bag. You did a sight more for that woman than anyone has ever done for her before, I dare say. She pressed her lips together and glanced over to where the women were just disappearing into their hut. Guilt niggled at her. I didn't want to come. From the moment I climbed the gangway to the wasp and saw the horrors of the harbour, I wanted to run back home to the plantation house. I only came because I knew Papa would need me. Yet if I hadn't, she couldn't voice the fact that if she hadn't come, Yanja and Moyo both would be dead now. But still, I often feel like I didn't do enough. Perhaps I should have tried to save her leg. Trent squatted before her with a roll of clean white bandages in his hand. For a long moment he didn't reply, only stared at a spot a long way down the beach. Finally he spoke quietly. I dare say, Miss Hunter, that feelings like those are what keep people from doing good for others more often. We often feel we can't do enough, or be enough, or give enough, so we don't even take the first step. When in reality, offering the best we can is better than offering nothing at all. He tipped her a look. You gave her the best you could, and don't be forgetting it. Had you tried to save her leg, she wouldn't have survived. You made the only decision you could. Ryan eased out a breath and had to concede with a nod. Trent dipped his chin in affirmation and peered at her firmly. Don't let what you could not do make you feel that what you could do was tainted by lack. He took the pot from her lap. Now then, let's see that hand. His fingers were warm and gentle as he carefully wrapped a length of the bandage around her palm, and then cut it and tied it off. Still squatting before her, he folded her fingers down over the bandage and covered her hand with his own. Take care of yourself while I'm away, will you? His gaze captured hers and held steady. Her chest refused to expand for any incoming breaths. She tore her gaze from his and looked down to where his hand remained wrapped around hers. The expanse over his knuckles was broad and brown and sturdy. A seamwork of veins drew her free hand before she thought better of it. But as soon as the warmth of his skin grazed her fingertips and penetrated her consciousness, she clenched both fists and withdrew from his touch. She ought to offer a witty comeback about how she could survive just fine without his help, but she couldn't seem to get the words to form on her lips and had to settle for a simple nod instead. Well then. He stood and held Papa's bag out to her. I'll return within a fortnight. She rose, accepted the bag, and cleared her throat, unable to meet his scrutiny. She missed him already, and didn't dare say more then. Good travelling, Captain. He turned as though to leave, but then spun back around to face her. I've asked Keiko to remain with you. If any need should arise, just send him to fetch me. He knows the route we plan to take. Ryan's gaze skittered to Papa before returning to his. Thank you, Captain. He bowed slightly. Very well. We are on our way at first light, and I'll see you in a few days when I return. He stopped and squatted by Papa's side. He gently touched Papa's shoulder, and, when he roused, said a few low words to him. The shush of the waves on the shore prevented her from hearing their exchange. Unfortunately, it didn't prevent emotion from clogging her airway. She looked toward the horizon. After a few moments, she heard the captain rise. He took two steps across the sand and then stilled. She spun to face him. He stood quietly, hands clasped behind his back, studying the ground. He pushed at a rock with the toe of his boot, and then his gaze lifted to hers, sending a jolt of awareness through her. For a long moment he studied her, his focus roaming across her features as though he was set on memorizing each contour and shadow. Her heart thudded against her ribcage. Perhaps she should tell him how she truly felt. She swallowed away the dryness parching her tongue. No, she must be considerate of the man's reputation. He at least deserved to make a well-informed choice in the matter. Besides, before any words would have had time to form, 
he tipped his head, gave her a bored wink, and without another look in her direction, strode off into the village. Ryan eased a breath through her lips. She allowed her gaze to linger until he disappeared into the cloak of dusk, and then she cleared her throat and forced herself to resume business as normal. As she returned to the hut, prepared Papa's pallet, and then helped him to it, all she could think about was how likely it was the captain would never lay eyes on her dear Papa again. How frail this man, who had always been so strong for her, had become. His skin, translucent as parchment, revealed every vein. His coughs had grown more thin and reedy over the past few days, even as she eased him to his pallet and placed one of her rolled-up petticoats beneath his head. Her heart lay heavy within her. Would this be the last time she helped him to bed? The last time she ran her fingers over thinning hair and smiled tremulously into his blue-gray eyes? The last time she would get to speak with him? She smoothed the covers over his chest. I love you, Papa. He lifted a trembling hand to her cheek. You look so much like her. Your mother. Her name was Arabella. Ryan held her breath. He'd never spoken of her mother this way before. Too weak to keep his hand aloft, he dropped it back to the coverlet. What I did to her was wrong in so many aspects. Wrong against Anne. Wrong against her. Wrong against you, he sighed. Ryan smoothed his hair. Don't fret yourself, Papa. He shook his head. No. You must listen. He wetted his lips. It was wrong. And I've asked the good Lord to forgive me a thousand times or more. He does, Papa. He does. Yes, child. But will you? Ryan blinked. She hadn't expected that. Whatever do you mean, Papa? Your life hasn't been easy, child. And though God brought good from my sin by opening my eyes to my need of him, the consequences of my actions have still run me through with grief many a day. He shuffled his hand across the blanket until it could clasp hers. Don't hold Anne's anger against her child. She will need you in the days to come. The anger she directs toward you is really with me. Tears stung Ryan's eyes. No words could form, but she managed a nod. So you see, much of the difficulty in your life stems from my sin. So I must seek your forgiveness. The tears spilled over and trickled down her cheeks. Of course, Papa. I forgive you. He sighed and seemed to relax. Waves of mercy. The words were barely audible as he patted the back of her hand and gave a little nod. Indeed, the Father above keeps sending them my way. And then his eyes dropped closed. It was only a moment before his breath deepened, though the rattle of the consumption gargled in his throat. Ryan dashed at the moisture on her face. Father in heaven, I know I don't perhaps approach you as often as I should, but please, for Papa's sake, all he's wanted for years was to serve you by starting a mission here. Give him time. Time to see that dream fulfilled. She paced the room until she was sure Papa indeed slept, then grabbed up the medical bag and hurried down to check on Nyanja. Ryan was pleased to find that Nyanja's leg appeared to be well on its way to healing and rewrapped a clean bandage around it. Only a few more days and then you won't need the bandages anymore. She offered the woman a smile, and when June translated the words to her, Nyanja gave a slight stretch of her lips in return. Though her lips barely formed the smile, her eyes showed her pleasure with a quiet certainty that warmed Ryan's heart. Well, I'll just be on my way. Nyanja stretched out a hand and spoke softly. Ryan looked to June for the translation. She asked if you have a moment. Ryan nodded and returned her focus to Nyanja. With June translating, the woman spoke, never taking her eyes off Ryan's face. I owe you much thanks. Ryan blinked. She had often wondered what the woman felt, 
especially since Ryan hadn't been able to save her leg. Words failed her, so she simply nodded. Nyanja picked at a loose piece of bamboo on the woven mat she would sleep on tonight. My people have a saying. No matter how long the night, dawn always comes. Her gaze lifted to Ryan's as June translated. Then she continued. Before you came to Commodore Cornwall's, I had nearly given up on seeing the dawn. Khalifa, he is a hard master. A man who cannot be pleased, no matter how one tries. Not even by his own daughter. Sorrow tugged at the corners of Nyanja's eyes as she cast a glance to where Muyo already slept on a pallet across the way. Ryan felt her own emotions threatening to flood her eyes. Nyanja pressed her lips together and seemed to gather herself for a moment before going on. I lost my leg, but I gained my freedom. And Moyo gained hers also. This is a gift for which I can never repay you. Oh, Nyanja, Ryan squeezed the woman's hand. I would never expect repayment from you. I only wish I could have saved your leg. I always regret that. Nyanja leaned forward, her eyes intense. Nothing behind us can be changed. It is better to walk forward than to curse the road. This I have chosen. It was what you chose the day you took my leg and saved my life. Because you walked the road put before you, I was taken off a wearisome rutted path and placed on a new smoother one. Now you must choose again. Ryan sighed and nodded. There was much wisdom in her words. She would not have chosen this road, but it seemed the good Lord had chosen it for her. So now she had another choice. Either walk or curse. Thank you, Nyanja. You have done my heart good with your words tonight. The woman nodded, and Ryan rose to take her leave. After a quick peek at Moyo, and a squeeze to June's shoulder, she returned up the beach on weary legs, and fell onto her own bed. She thought her weariness would drag her to the depths of sleep swiftly tonight, but her mind didn't seem to be as exhausted as her body. She prayed again for Papa, and then added a prayer for Mother, Jasmine and Rory. Soon she would have to send them disturbing news. But she prayed it would be a few weeks, rather than the days she feared it would be. Please, God. She pondered the captain's words from earlier and realized they were quite true. She considered Papa. Certainly he was here because he hadn't wanted his family to watch him die, but he was also here because he felt the need to help these people, despite his obvious limitations. Had she ever truly wanted to help someone out of a pure motive? She'd helped Papa doctor people back on the island, but mostly because it allowed her to spend time with him and gave them a common bond. And she'd come after Papa on this trip. Truth be told, She'd only come after him because she'd wanted to convince him to return home with her, because she needed him in her life, needed his love so badly. She pondered. Helping Nyanja might be the first truly selfless thing she'd done in her whole life, and yet what she'd been able to do seemed to have fallen so short. And yet Nyanja had been content, even pleased, it seemed, with the outcome. Across the room, Papa's breaths rattled in his throat her own throat clogged with terror and sorrow. When his time came, she knew she wouldn't have enough to offer him. There would be no tonic she could give, no healing she could supply. Consumption took whom it would, with nary a request for permission. Father in heaven, you ask too much. I know I must be strong, but I feel so alone, so helplessly inadequate. Bishop Tozer often said that if you waited silently and listened carefully, the Almighty would sometimes speak to you. But even though Ryan lay awake long into the darkness, she heard no heavenly response to all the prayers she directed God's way that evening. And yet, a verse she had memorized in one of Bishop Tozer's Sunday classes came to her mind, as clearly as though she were reading it on the page. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, 
I will rather boast in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And with that reminder came a wave of peace. She could worry about her lack of ability to make Papa better, and fret over what she'd do once he passed, until she was not but a tight ball of twine. Yet none of it would do her a whit of good. For perhaps it was only once she totally gave up reliance on her own strength that the Lord could best use her. Father, forgive me. Perhaps it is I who ask too much. I am weak, weak in knowledge, weak in fear of the unknown. Please, make your strength perfect in me. I don't know how to glory in my infirmities. I think that's something you'll have to grow in me over time, but I will try not to fret so much. As she continued to pour out her heart, her eyes grew heavy, and her consciousness gave way to rest. This has been Made Perfect in Weakness, a serialized historical Christian romance. Sonnets of the Spice Isle, Book 3. Written by Lynette Bonner. Narrated by Mary Sarah Agliotta. Copyright 2016 by Lynette Bonner. Production copyright 2017 by Lynette Bonner. If you enjoyed this audio production of Made Perfect in Weakness, continue the story with Episode 4, A Walk Through the Waters, found on Amazon, Audible, and iTunes.